All right, everyone, uh, welcome back to yet another stream. Um, I'll do the the spiel from the beginning just uh, just before we get into the stream. So I'm John. I uh, I do a bunch of these live coding streams um, of sort of various different things, but in general, the goal is to write somewhat more intermediate or advanced Rust material for people who um, have some inter some beginning grasp on the language or is coming to it from from a programming background and want to learn or see the language being used in, in sort of more advanced ways or to build real stuff. Um, I have a Patreon page where I post updates whenever I uh, do video streams or recordings from past streams or I solicit um, suggestions for what streams to do next. Um, so if you want to like watch me there, you can do that. Otherwise, I also post basically all the announcements to Twitter. So either is basically fine. Um, I post all of the recordings to YouTube afterwards. So if you go to uh, like this page, um, so on my YouTube channel, there's a playlist for all the Rust uh, live coding sessions we've done. Um, oh, it's really slow today. Um, so if you go into this playlist, it has all of the old videos, um, and I'll keep adding new ones there as long as we record them. Um, so this stream is a little bit different, and I don't quite know yet how it's going to work out, but I have this idea of like over the course of my Rust programming, there are lots of times where I sit down and I like want to use something that someone else has written. Like I don't always want to write everything from scratch, even though it's fun. Um, and so every now and again, like you end up using some software other people have used and there either as a library or a binary, you need to depend on it in some way. Um, or even if you just want to like expand your knowledge of Rust and you want to contribute to something someone else has built, then usually what ends up happening is I open up, I end up in some GitHub or GitLab repository and like, now what? Uh, and I figured it would be pretty cool to try to show what that experience is like to come to someone else's code base and like figure out what's going on, figure out um, how the crate is organized and so, and also how we might contribute to it. And so, sorry, is I can't imagine not using other crates. It's possible. Uh, you often don't want to do it. But, but so, for example, one of the things that I've done a lot is write relatively primitive crates, like things that are like data structures, for example, where you often end up not depending on any other crates or if you do very few or like only for testing and benchmarking. But in any case, um, I sat down and figured like, how about we just do a stream where I do open source contributions, which is a little bit terrifying, I'm not gonna lie, because it means I'm gonna dive into some code base I know nothing about and have never used and going to try to like modify it live. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, and so I outlined this on Twitter and I got a, a bunch of responses where people who seem pretty excited about it. And the basic idea is we're gonna look at some crates that people have suggested. We're gonna look at um, how the crate is organized, try to figure out what it does, like look at the readme, the documentation, how the source sort of fits together um, and try to give some feedback on those, either if the authors are watching or just for our own sake, like which things do we feel like they've done well? Which things would you perhaps do differently if you were to write this project from scratch? Um, and then we're gonna try, although we'll see how well this works, to see if we can contribute to the code in some way, like whether that is improving the documentation, improving the readme, adding some feature to the code, looking for a known bug. Like it depends a little bit on the crate and what kind of um, sort of how sophisticated it is and also how well developed it is. Uh, some of these are relatively early on in their development and some are later on. Uh, and so we're gonna like look at the bug tracker and see what we can find there. Um, and we'll see, like my hope is to spend maybe an hour to an hour and a half per crate, but we'll see, it depends a little bit on how expansive the changes we wanna make are. Um, remember that this is, this sort of ends up being pretty collaborative, right? I'm, I know very little more about these crates than you do. So if you see something that you think we should change, something we should point out to the, to the authors, something you would like us to try to change or something you don't understand and want to know why is there, then f feel free to like ask in chat and I will try to address them and also sort of go along with you. Um, and we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, one thing I would like is after the stream is over, I'll take like a few minutes just to sort of sum up things with you and see if I can get any feedback on uh, how you think this format worked, whether you think this was interesting, um, whether there are particular 
uh, crates you would like me to see me do next, whether you'd even like me to s like to see me do this again. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. I think it'll be fun. Um, I also want to point out uh, Nathan Linnitz uh, just donated fifty dollars a month on Patreon, which I think is really cool. This is a person I have no idea who he is, but he decided to give me money, and that's amazing. Uh, thanks. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Before we start, there was some. Um, how about reviewing the regex crate? Okay, so I have gotten a couple of recommendations for like really large crates uh, or really sophisticated and mature crates like cargo, uh, regex, servo, um, uh, and a couple of, and like just the compiler. And while that would be interesting, that is a very different sort of monster. So in a sense, what I wanted to do here was look at um, things are sort of still in flux and still in development and where there's some hope that we can understand what's going on in 90 minutes. This is not true for any of the large and very sophisticated crates, right? Um, like even just regex, which is a somewhat smaller crate, is a really sophisticated uh, beast of a crate right now. And even, even though I, know, I happen to know that it's pretty well developed, uh, trying to dive into that and do something useful in 90 minutes is going to be pretty hard. Um, one thing we could do is do a stream where we uh, pick a crate and just try to understand it without even trying to contribute anything. We could do that. There would be a lot less programming in it and more just reading code. Um, but we'll, we'll see. It's not It's not a bad idea. It's just hard to balance. Uh, do you already have crates picked or do you need suggestions? I do have some crate prick, picked. So um, I did a Twitter poll uh, over the couple of suggestions I got. And this was sort of the... The winner, this is a part of uh, GraphQL implemented in Rust. Um, and so specifically the hyper bindings for that we're going to look at. Then we're going to look at Tokyo Beanstalk D, which is a um, Tokyo implementation of working with the Beanstalk um, protocol, which is sort of similar but simpler than the Zookeeper stream we did in the past. Uh, and then Argonautica is implementation of a um, Rust password hashing uh, algorithm, or it's a it's a password hashing algorithm and the implementation of it in Rust. Um, and so I feel like these are three relatively different things. And so that's why I feel like they match up pretty well and they all got some decent amount of interest. Uh, there are some others too that maybe we'll get around to looking later. If you have other suggestions and like ping me on Twitter or something and I'll try to queue them up. Uh, yeah, Nathan, I saw, I appreciate it. Um, in a sense, I'm, uh, it would be great to get to 150, but that's also a bunch of work. So it's like, I, I, I really, I do really appreciate it. Uh, but it, this particular week is also a lot of stuff is going on. There was the deadline. So I was like, <laughs> but it worked out. Uh, thanks though. Um, let's see. Ooh, author of the, okay. So we have the author of this crate here. Fantastic. Uh, you can of course still suggest li more crates. Um, we probably won't get around to them in this stream. Um, but if you like put them in the chat or tweet them at me or something, then I will add them to my ever growing list of things I want to cover in streams. Sadly, I only have so much time. Um, all right, let's dig into Juniper Hyper first. So in sort of the same spirit as with all the previous streams, I've tried to not do any work ahead of the stream. Uh, so this is in part so that you don't feel like you're missing anything, like any part of the experience. It's also so that um, you can observe my entire process of going through something new, as opposed to me having like fully prepared before we sit down and know where everything is, because I don't think that would be helpful to you. Uh, and it's sort of disingenuous because that's not really what the experience is like. And I want, I want people to realize that programming is like not, it doesn't just happen, like, right? You need to invest some work. Um, all right, so Juniper Hyper. Let's find out what Juniper is first. Uh, so Juniper GraphQL. Okay, so it's some kind of data query language. And this is a Rust implementation. Does not include a web server. Okay, so it's like sort of like a database, but without a web server or any kind of web API. And integrations for Hyper. All right, so I'm mean, taking a wild stab here, but it seems like this is a, it's like a way to set up, um, I mean, just judging from the name, you set up graphs of data structures and then you have some way of querying those data structures 
and the hyper thing is going to be um, a wrapper around that so that you can make requests to the stored data over the network. Let's uh, look and see if I got it right. Uh, okay, data query language. Oh, well, this is pretty unhelpful. How do I use it? Give me an example. Examples? There is no examples directory. What about here? No. Uh, getting started. Quick start. Great. Quick start. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So it's like a, you set up structs, they have relationships to one another, and there's probably like a, okay, yeah. So you declare objects, and you can search the objects. Okay, yeah, so it's just, you're querying for data in some structured manner. All right, now the question is, what is Juniper Hyper? Because that's the thing we're actually looking at. We're not gonna look at all of Juniper. Uh, pinpoint, a little crate for pinning. Ooh. Yeah, can you um can you ping me with that on Twitter? Because this will get lost in the chat. Uh why not ask the author here? Well, I mean we could, but usually you're not able to ask the author. Um also I think he's the author just of the hyper part, but I might be wrong. Um okay. So let's see what we got here. Ooh, example. Good. All right, example is a good start. Let's look at the example. Uh, oh, future CPU pool. That looks weird. I don't think future CPU pool should be here. Why do I need to build a CPU pool? Isn't this Tokyo? This is using hyper. This should just be a Tokyo pool. That way you wouldn't have to clone the pool in here. Oh yeah, regardless. So the setting up a hyper service. So hyper, for those who aren't aware, um, hyper is a Rust web framework, both for clients and servers. Um, and it's sort of built entirely asynchronously around futures and, uh, and Tokyo. Uh, and the idea is that you set up a bunch of services and every service is responsible for routing the request that gets in. You're basically like, you're sort of given a, you're given a request and you have to populate a response and it's all asynchronous. Um, and so a service is just a thing that can re reply to requests. Um, in this case, yeah, so here you see this is basically doing routing, right? Like it's looking at the method in the URI and then it's doing some stuff in response. Okay, so this, this, is, this example is then basically the, the hyper part. Why is this in the example? Okay, so the thing, what does this, let's look at the docs. Okay, so Juniper Hyper provi provides these two functions. Um, interesting. I wonder why just those two, that seems like a weird thing for this crate to provide. Like I would expect a crate that's supposed to provide web bindings to provide web bindings. Whereas it, it looks like from this example, it looks like the user has to come up with the, the actual routing, right? Cause this is, this is in the example code. So the idea is this would be in, in your code. Uh, and so I guess the question is, what are these functions? Right, because it's routing, it's routing these to different things. So it looks like get slash IQL. Okay, so what's the difference? These two names are not clear. What's the difference between these two? Oh, that, uh, I would say that the first thing that's lacking in this script is uh, documentation. Maybe, so in theory, that is something we could provide. Um, graph. You just forward the request to Juniper. I see. I see. So, but if you're just forwarding, then why is this crate necessary? That's, I guess, I want to know what this function does. That's a good source. So, IQL, this just uses Juniper directly. <laughs> to request an endpoint and just construct a body. Okay, so this is extremely straightforward, right? Like th this method is just calling whatever that method is. And, and that's notice specifically, this is in the Juniper crate, not in Juniper hyper. So this wrapper seems pretty straightforward. What is the, I feel like it should be named something else. Uh, Twitch don't have communities anymore. don't have a game creative. Uh, Oh, 
I mean, my stream isn't game programming, so. Uh, GraphQL is a UI for the GraphQL backend. Yeah, but why? I see, so the response, so what you're saying is, um, this call here just essentially prints some HTML of some kind. We could probably just run this. I just wanna, I, li I like exploring the, the high level part of the, the crate first before trying to run anything myself. Cause I don't, it, it might not be that we even need to run this. All right, so, the, so this is just like, I guess I is for index maybe. Um, so this just provides you with the graphical index, the UI. All right, so what does this other thing do? Because that, that's what all the, uh, the seemingly interesting endpoints go to, right? You go to slash GraphQL, then something else happens. So this takes a, pool, a CPU pool, which I think is really weird. Uh, all right, so this further matches on the method. Fascinating. I, I feel like some of this stuff should probably go, th there should be like a, a wrapper that's provided by the crate. So that might be something we could build. So this takes, what is a root node here? Okay, so root node is the root of the data structure we're searching over. CTX is DB, which is database. Okay, so I don't know what the difference, okay, so database is like the entire collection of objects and root node is the one we start searching for, would be my guess. Uh, and then pool, unclear why they need a pool, I guess we'll find out later. And then they're passing the request in for the, to this GraphQL. So okay, so GraphQL is the main thing provided by this crate, it seems like. Uh, it matches on the method, and if it does a get, then, I see. Okay, so mainly what this crate is, this crate is doing is mapping HTTP re HTTP requests to GraphQL requests, and then taking the responses and mapping them back. It seems like, right? So if you get a if you get a post, you essentially parse the body, you make it into a request. Yeah. So here, for example, notice it's basically taking the body of the request, uh, turning it into a string, uh, parsing it as JSON into a GraphQL request, and then doing this execute request business. And the response that comes back, oh, I see. So execute request is really the thing we want to look at. So execute request. I wonder why this uses pool.spawn. Like, why does this not use Tokyo spawn? Why are they using like this future CPU pool? That seems odd. Um, Request.execute. So request is the GraphQL request. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, so that's what we parsed it into. Um, yeah, okay. And then it, it just does a new response, which is presumably then mapping a GraphQL response into a, into whatever web response we want to give. So where is new response? Yeah, okay, so just, great. So it just creates a response. Right. So the sort of main stuff of this is really mapping then between HTTP and the underlying GraphQL. It also looks like all of this is a single file, which is a little sad. Um, uh, CPU pool is needed because Hyper is async and Juniper is blocking. So Tokyo has Tokyo blocking, which I think fixes that problem for you. Um, so that's another thing we could do is we could um, use Tokyo blocking to get rid of the future CPU pool and just have it be Tokyo all the way. Um, to make it a little bit nicer to work with. And you would also avoid having two thread pools. So currently you end up both with the hyper thread pool and the future CPU pool, which is a little unfortunate. Uh, currently the stream is not easily discoverable for anyone who's not already aware you're streaming. Oh, there's a programming category. Sure, let's fix that while we're at it. Uh, 
actually, should we do that? Sure. Well, it's the worst that could happen. Uh, uh, dashboard, I think. No, maybe channel. No, dashboard. Sorry, you want the category here to be programming. Great, update. Great, it's now a programming channel. Nice. Um, not really sure what the difference is between CPU pool and Tokyo's thread pool. Uh, so Tokyo's thread pool uh, does work stealing and it's also where Hyper will be executing. So uh, because Hyper is based on Tokyo, Hyper spins up a, uh, a bunch of futures and it spawns them on a Tokyo thread pool normally. And so now by using future CPU pool, you have two thread pools running. You have the CPU pool that you explicitly constructed and also the thread pool that Tokyo started. Um, in particular here, when you do server bind, so that's a hyper server. And if you look at hyper, I mean, unless you're depending on a very old version of, uh, let's see, cargo tunnel of hyper. No, 0, 012. Okay, so if you look at server, um, server, 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 bind, uh, returns a builder, right? So what do you do with this builder? You call dot serve, uh, builder. Yeah, so if you call dot serve, if I rem right, so the thing you get back needs to be spawned somewhere. So currently this example, this server that you get back, you run RT run and RT. So hyper RT, if we go back here, uh, hyper RT default runtime. So the default runtime for hyper is a Tokyo runtime and a Tokyo runtime starts up its own CPU pool. And so what you end up is this is starting a this is already starting a thread pool for managing all the hyper futures. And then in addition, you're creating a separate thread pool for doing Juniper request processing. Um, this is no longer necessary because if you look at Tokyo Executor, where is the oh I guess this is probably now in Tokyo Executor. Uh hmm? Run prelude or uh, runtime. Runtime. Mm, where is blocking? Well, that's a good question. So there's a there's a blocking there's a blocking function now that gives you a future that runs a blocking operation. Tokyo thread pool. Tokyo this function. Yeah, so this um, takes a function and gives you back a, a thing you can pull. And so basically it gives you back a future, but it makes sure that it, it like still reuses the, the various threads that are already in the pool to execute the job. So this is probably what you want rather than have a separate CPU pool. And this might be the, the conversion we want to make on this crate. Um, The creative category. Uh, okay, yeah, that's fine. I think I think the change I made was correct, right? To the Twitch category. All right. So so blocking seems like a good candidate here because it would avoid spinning up two thread pools. Um, and let's see. The other thing it's doing is really just mapping between hyper requests and GraphQL requests and GraphQL responses and hyper responses, right? So GraphQL execute uh, really just does does an execute and what does it do with the response? So it does execute and then GraphQL response is one of these. Okay, so this suggests that really it's just like JSON encoding the response probably. All right, so the crate itself seems pretty straightforward. Like I think this is basically the entire contents of it. Um, the thing we'll want to, so I think that the two things we could do here, um, one would be to get rid of this extra pool, which I think is a, a pretty nice change to the crate. Um, the second would be to add some documentation to it, which like is maybe interesting, but it's unclear. 
Um, the third thing we could do here, hmm. The third thing we could do is this business. We could probably wrap up instead of it being an example. Um, in fact, this ex part of this example code should probably be in the documentation too. But um, instead of this just being in the example, it seems pretty reasonable for um, this crate to provide this provide this service explicitly. I, like, there's no reason for every user of this crate to have to write this code, right? I guess the question is like, what if they have other things they want to match on? Uh, maybe, maybe. I guess this does let you change the URL pattern, but it might be nice to provide like a shortcut for users who just want the bindings. Um, in fact, I almost wonder whether this shouldn't be an example, but instead just be a binary, just like a straight binary. Maybe. Um, in a PR. Ooh, let's look at PRs. Uh, hi, Bert. Mm -hmm. Hi, Bert version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see. <laughs> I don't think it should need CPU pool, so that's separate. Uh, oh, hey, I know DGC. Or rather, I've contributed with him on a different crate. Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah, so, okay, so this is the observation, right? Um, Yeah. Okay, so maybe the goal then should just be to be able to simplify the example. Um, right, so they can write whatever integration they want. All right, let's give, let's give this a try. So I guess uh, we're gonna do something like fork. Um, PR 230, that's the one I had open, right? I think. Uh, 230, yeah, that's the one I wrote. Um, all right, we have a fork. I'm gonna get to clone this. So usually what I like to do is, um, if I'm contributing to a crate, I usually have um, two remotes. So I have uh, I have origin point to my branch, and then I have one called upstream. Uh, add upstream this one. Um, let's also do, and then I point master to upstream. So the master is not pointing to my fork, uh, and then I make a new branch. So in this case, what we're gonna do is uh, remove CPU pool, move hyper CPU pool, and then Juniper hyper. Let's do our cargo check. Let's see if we can build this thing in the first place. That would be, that would be handy. Um, okay, so the the real question we wanna, we need to deal with now is, if I can get back to the docs somehow. All right. Oh, great, we can build it. Fantastic. All right, so um, we basically need this function to not take a CPU pool, right? Instead, it should just give you back a future. Yeah, and this could probably be impl future. I don't think this needs to be box. Depends how performance critical this is. Um, but I guess let's focus on getting rid of the pool. Um, so so here's what we're gonna do. Oh no. Oh, it's almost Rust formatted. <laughs> nope. Oh, that formatted everything. Okay, so Juniper is not formatted for the Rust format. Fine. Uh, this though, I guess. 
fine. We'll just ignore that change later. Uh, right, so over here, um, I guess we would need to change cargo Tomal to get rid of the CPU pool and move Tokyo to be a dependency. Um, moving Tokyo to be a dependency is actually fine because Hyper already pulls in Tokyo. So we're not actually adding a dependency. We're, we're making an, an implicit dependency explicit. Um, it should be fine. Uh, so now there will no longer be a future CPU pool. Instead, there will be uh, Tokyo always. The hypergrid itself should be Rust format. Um, so it mostly is. I'm running the latest nightly, which is probably why it's um, why it's complaining. Specifically, the only real diff is this business down here. That's the only diff it makes. Um, so that's probably a Rust format uh, nightly change. So I would not worry about it. Um, so now it's obviously not going to compile. Okay, so we need to figure out how we want this to work. So specifically, um, I guess the concern is when you call a GraphQL, we're going to have to do something that's blocking, which is fine. So we're going to use Tokyo blocking for that, which means we have to pull in Tokyo thread pool because that's where the blocking function lives. Uh, Tokyo has been moving in this direction of instead of instead of having all the things exposed through the Tokyo crate, they have lots of other crates, and then Tokyo just exposes like the really essentials that are not expecting to change. The reason for this is they can improve the other crates without having to issue um, like breaking changes or anything to Tokyo itself. Um, so in this case, we'll need Tokyo thread pool zero one seven. Uh, Extern create Tokyo thread pool. All right. Uh, so, yeah, so the question is what are we going to do about GraphQL? I think it does not need to take a thread pool. Instead, what it's going to do is just call. Um, so, I guess execute request is the part that's blocking. So I think all it really has to do is return a blocking thing. Oh, these arguments are not pretty, but I guess it's fine. Um, I think this can also just be impl future. It does not need to be boxed. Um, yeah, so down here, I guess execute request. And execute request. Okay, they both use execute request. So that's really, we can just modify an ex execute request here, right? Uh, graph IQL, this can also be impl future. Oh, I guess the reason why impl future is a little annoying here is because we have different return values depending on, we have, we have different futures that return depending on whether it's a get or a, get or a post or anything else. So that's probably why it was originally a box. Um, we can get around this using either. So uh, futures, I think it's in future either. Um, so we would do either a, either a, I, the double A is a little annoying, but I'll show you in a second why it's necessary. Uh, B. So either is a is a either. So there are only two options, right? It's left or right, or A and B. And in this case, we want to return three different things. Specifically, this is one, this is two, and this is three. And the way you get three from two binaries is uh, you you wrap the binary. So in this case, this would be uh, either B, right? So the type of A A contains an either. B is just this. Um, so now that can be impl future. This can just be impl future directly anyway. Uh, new HTML response. So isn't this a blocking call? I guess we don't really know, but to me, this seems like something that might block. But given the current writing, I guess. Uh, is the call to graph IQL source blocking? Because if it is, this should be wrapped in Tokyo blocking, right? Like we should 
we should mark this as also being a block in the future. Um, so now execute request is gonna return something that's an impl future. Okay, that's great. Ah, so here impl future was used already. So my guess is for the box is because they didn't, they tried impl future, it didn't compile, and they were just like, ah, let's just box it. Uh, the reason is because impl future only works when there's a single future type that's being returned. If you have, um, so if you try to do like fn foo impl future, and then you do like if a else, and like this is some future, and this is some other future, this will not work because impl future is going to say there's no one type. So you should think of impl future as like, um, there is a single type here, I just don't want to name it, right? But in this case, there is no single type for the return value because these two futures, this and this, have different types. Uh, even though they both implement future the same way, they're different things. And so the way you get around this is by doing uh, uh, either A and either B. And so now the there's only a single uh, type that's being returned, and that's an either, um, which is generic over its left and right future. Um, all right, great. So we got rid of a heap allocation. That's good. Uh, oh, yeah, either is fantastic. Um, let's see, what else we have? OK, so we got rid of the pool from here. And now the question is down here, what do we do? So this doesn't actually have to be lazy anymore. Uh, this is now really just uh, wait, why does this oh uh, 40 did I put the wrong number of parentheses somewhere probably oh uh, yes here and also here, and also somewhere else, 52. And an extra comma, and another extra comma. Great. Um, so it was oh, interesting. OK, so the code now actually compiled, even though there's no pool. And the reason for this is now we're just like executing this request um, directly on the current thread. And so you should think of Tokyo as it spins up a pool of threads. Um, and those threads are supposed to keep processing futures. And if and um, what what happens if you put like an expensive blocking call somewhere? Like imagine you like do like an expensive file system operation, or you do like even just you do a loop that just spins forever, then that thread pool worker, that that one worker in Tokyo cannot process any more futures. Um, and so imagine that you had like four futures and all of them just did a spinny loop or they did something that blocks. Now, if you only had four cores, there would only be four threads in that pool. If all of them are just spinning, then none of the other um, futures you have get executed. So like if there are another HTTP requester comes in or something, it will not be processed. Um, and so the way we deal with this is um, that we tell Tokyo that a given... Um, a given worker is now uh, blocking. So it's it's doing something so that it's not going to be able to handle futures for a while. Um, and then Tokyo is going to respond to that by essentially spinning up some extra threads or keeping some extra threads to make sure that like the rest of the world continues working. Um, so in this case, what we're really going to do is we're going to do uh, Tokyo uh, thread pool blocking. So blocking is going to do this. Yes. So this is going to return us a future, and then uh, and then the response of that is we're going to do this uh, mapping that originally happened. I guess this does this even do any? I think this is just a map. I don't think this needs to be an end then. This is the map. Uh, 
interesting. Oh, I guess actually, um, we probably want the blocking stuff to happen all the way in at request execute. So we're gonna have request execute return a uh, a future an impl future. Yeah. All right, so execute. Where are you? Here. So this is now gonna do. It's gonna return an impl future, uh, where the item is this, and the error is. Um, blocking error, this thing. Now this is not something we want to expose to the user. In fact, why is this pub? Why is this not? That makes no sense. Request is not pub, so this is not pub. Um, yeah, so if you try to execute a request, what we're really gonna do is we're gonna execute it. Uh, we're gonna return a future that will eventually resolve to it being, it having finished. And in this case, uh, oh, I see this does multiple blocking requests. Fascinating. All right, so this business, what's a Juniper GraphQL request? Okay, so this is the actual blocking call. So here is where we're gonna have Tokyo thread pool uh, blocking takes a closure that's going to execute. Uh, and then we're going to map that into a single response. Great. Um, if you get a batch of requests, um, then we're going to do, ooh, I don't know if it's going to be OK for this execute to be on a ref to self. I guess this is where we have to find out what the Juniper API is like. So the, where is it? GraphQL requests, I guess. Hmm? GraphQL request, HTTP maybe? Here, request. Oh, execute returns a response that's tied to the request. That's awful. Um, yeah, that's kind of awkward. So the problem here, of course, is that um, this future is just like spun up in the background. Hmm. Hum, 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 hum. Yeah, specifically, execute return something that borrows request. Uh, and I wonder if blocking, does blocking need to be static? Maybe not. It does not. Specifically, closure does not. Hmm. This might not compile, which is a little sad. Mm. Let's see. Why don't I see the whole thing in a blocking call? So, um, that is basically what we're doing. It's just that it wouldn't help. So if, if blocking requires its argument to be static, then we can't give it any closure because any closure is going to have to borrow the GraphQL request. Um, wait a second. So the execute he up here is given the request. Wait, why? Oh, I see. So really, we do have self here. The problem is just what do we, what's the lifetime of the return future? Um, oh, I see, that's why it's, okay. I mean, let's, let, this might actually work. Let's try this. Um, 
So specifically, if we get a batch of requests, what we want to do is uh, we want to do an execute for all of them. So there are a couple of ways to do this in, in Tokyo. If you have, you want to essentially wait on a bunch of futures. Um, and the way to do this is 0.1. Let's see, uh, future, uh, join all. I think is the one we want. Yeah. And a join all, I think, is a stream. No, it's a vec. OK, great. Yeah, so that is what we want. So specifically, what we're going to do here is we're going to do a futures future join all. I guess this comes from if we just use the Tokyo prelude. That brings in future as well. And it brings in future. And I guess oh, we might as well bring this in. That's fine. Uh, so we're going to do a join all across request.iter.map. Um, this, right? And this is now going to be a blocking. Like so. Uh, we don't need the collect anymore. The join all is going to produce a vector for us that we can then just map into the final batch. And this is now an either, right? Because the two different match arms are different types. Uh, it's probably going to complain all over the place. That's fine. Um, 95. All oh, right, it's going to complain that the error here. Wait, why is this generic over the error type? I don't think that's true. I think this is specifically a Tokyo thread pool blocking error. Now, down the line, this error might have to be more refined. Specifically, um, I think that error type is going to have to be something like uh, derived from the Juniper error type so that you can also return Juniper errors, right? I guess the question is whether Juniper execute. Uh, yeah, so execute here will, my guess is at some point will return a result, but I guess the response maybe contains that error anyway. Um, Two. Sorry, what is it complaining about? It's complaining about a lot of things. All right, let's look at 51 first. So here it's saying um, type mismatch. The error should be a GraphQL request error. Right, because here, I see. So up here, we're making the error type be GraphQL request error. Uh, so the question is, what do we even want to do here? Uh, I think what we want to do is ignore the blocking error and just make it a GraphQL uh, request error. Sure, invalid. I mean, it's not really invalid, but uh, this is going to be something like no more capacity to execute requests. So this would happen if we already have lots and lots of threads that are, um, we have lots and lots of threads that are already executing these blocking requests and Tokyo is saying, I'm refusing to spin up any more threads. Um, you can set the limit on the pool for what, um, what you want that limit to be. Uh, in fact, we could hoist this could put this further in, but I think for now, we're just going to put it here. Now what? Uh, type mismatch on 208. Right, so here it's saying uh, expected signature. Fn. 
Oh, right. What does blocking actually returns? It returns a pole. Oh, I see. Oh, that's awkward. So we need a pole event, is what you're saying. So this is so blocking. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, then blocking doesn't return a future. It just returns whether it is currently executing that blocking call or not, right? So it it might return you a blocking error if that thing is not yet ready. Um, if, if there are no threads available to do the blocking call. Um, and so I think what we want here, so imagine that um, you're, you have four cores, you're currently executing four blocking futures, and Tokyo goes, no, I'm not gonna spin up another thread for you, then the call to blocking is gonna return an error. Um, and so really what we want to do in that case is every now and again, retry it. Um, essentially we want to pull whether there are available threads. And the way we do that is by using uh, future poll of n, which really just uh, tries to execute the future until it succeeds, which is what we want in this case. Um, so here, I guess the question is, what is a blocking error then? Why does it, well, that's unhelpful. Uh, return. Oh, if the thread pool is shut down, I see. So really this should just like not, this is not no more capacity because that would return not ready. Uh, so in this case, uh, this is just, this is really like thread pool has shut down, which I think should never happen. So I think we can just do unreachable. Because this shouldn't ever happen. Um, and so this is going to be a pull fn around this. And same here. Now 198, right, so actually we need, ah, uh, oh, it's a little awkward. So because we're carrying along the root node and the context into the closure in here, um, and that might, like, we might return from this function almost immediately, right? Um, because we, we try to put it on the thread pool and it like is, there aren't enough threads and so it's gonna run it later. And so these references, um, need to stay alive for as long as this future is alive. And so what we're gonna do then is we're gonna have a tick F and these and the future are tick F. And then we're also gonna have to say that uh, tick A outlives tick F. So basically the reference to self also has to live as long as F because um, otherwise the future wouldn't resolve, right? And now it's probably going to complain about all sorts of ownership issues. So 109 here, request does not live long enough. Uh, wait, why are all these things borrowing? They don't need to be borrowing. If they are not borrowing, that makes this a lot easier. Because now this is no longer a reference. This is an arc to that. This is no longer a reference, it's an arc to that. Now this doesn't have to be F anymore. So we're gonna move into here, this. Um, let's see what else we have. Mismatch type, 206. I guess this is now going to borrow these. One ninety-eight. Explicit lifetime required in the type of root node. Oh, root, root node takes a lifetime too. All right, one oh nine. Uh, 
request does not live long enough. Well, the request is actually owned. So let's just have this just take self instead. And this now has to be generic over A, but just for the root node. Ah, yes. Unfortunate. Hmm. That's a good question. Okay, so the problem here is that the the response we're giving back is tied to the request. So we can't uh, we can't produce a result. So the reason this is awkward actually is because we want the ability to have this freestanding execute request bit. Um, because this thing, it, it changes, okay, so let's, let me rephrase. The problem we're running into is that we're trying to uh, do a request, we're execute a request and that's gonna take a while. And the response is tied to the lifetime of the request. Um, the problem then is that means that the request has to live for as long as we want to run this thing for. Um, but we own the request and we want to move it into uh, where we execute it. But the problem is then the response um, is still tied to that lifetime. So to phrase that differently, when we the thing we get back from executing the request still borrows the request. So if we just hear return, then request would be dropped and then the response is no longer valid, right? So I think really the thing to do here is to provide a map. Yes. So we're gonna consume self. Uh, yeah, okay. So crucially, the problem here is the response only lives for as long as request is alive. Request is still alive here when we execute, but the moment we return, request is dropped, so the response is no longer valid. Which means that we basically need to map the response in here to, to get rid of its lifetime. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna allow execute to be given a mapping function. Um, and so there's gonna be an F and an R, uh, and this is gonna return an R. So F is going to be an FN uh, mute and it's going to be given a GraphQL response and going to have to give us an R, right? Does that make sense? So what we're now going to do is we're going to have this uh, dot map map and same here. So map map. And so now notice the response is no longer time to the lifetime of self. This can now be moved into the function. Um, I think that should do it. Uh, now 199, the execute function that we had up here somewhere. This is now gonna pass in the mapping closure directly. GraphQL response found type parameter. Why? Oh. Uh. Yeah. That's kind of awkward. Okay, so the real way to fix this is just to not have this be a separate method. But I don't really want to pull that out. Mm. Okay, so the problem now is um, our mapping function is over a GraphQL response. But the problem is that we don't have the GraphQL response until we've resolved all of these. And they are still all borrowing 
request. Although that might be fine. We might be able to have this just not move into this. Not map here. So then the request is still borrowed at this point. Uh, this is now an either a, all right, we already did that. And then the future that comes back from this, we map with map before we end up dropping self. Maybe. Specifically now, a reference to the request is going to be passed in there. Yeah, the problem is there's no, there's no well-defined owner of request is really what's going on. Uh, yeah, mixing blocking and, and asynchronous code like this is always a bit of a pain. Um, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder whether Hmm. It's just really problematic that the why is the response tied to the lifetime of the request? This seems really odd, Juniper. Why have you done this? So uh, execute to the response. Why is the response, what does it contain? Oh, the TK is only there for the error? Oh, that's awful. Oh man, that's a bad choice, Juniper. Ah, oh, that's not worth it. Errors should be rare. That's awful. Um, yeah, that makes us a pain. So notice that if um, if executes response did not was not tied to the request, none of this would be a problem. the The problem is specifically that the tick a of self here is tied to the tick a in the response. Um, No, because, well, the input bytes are only used if you return an error. And if you are returning an error, then cloning is fine, right? The standard operation should be not getting errors. And so it's fine to make the errors a little more, a little more expensive. Um, well, then. Um, yeah. Yeah, the real problem here is just like that the request ends up being dropped. Hmm. But I don't know how to avoid that easily. Um. So the way we could do this is like, wrap the uh, request in an arc. Because like, okay, this case is trivial because here we just uh, dot map GraphQL response single map map. So that part is fine, I think, because there we know the request doesn't get dropped. Um, uh, 
All oh, right, after the oh, it can't be after the poll. It's like match on this, and if it is okay. Async ready v. So if we get the value out, then we want to produce map of GraphQL response single of v. Right. So this erases the lifetime. Uh, so that's fine. And anything else, if we get os, so we guess okay. Async ready this. Uh, if we get okay, async not ready, then we really just. Oh, I guess actually the nicer way to do this would be. one ugly future. So the idea is that we try to do this blocking and if it succeeds, then we immediately map the result. And this is still happening, uh, I guess here, this is still happening while we have a reference to the request. And so that's all fine. The problematic case is this business because here we can't pull the same trick because there are multiple of this request. So this is going to be into it. Uh, and each, yeah, so here the real problem is we can't call map on the entire batch. Uh, maybe you can convert it early on into a GraphQL request error. No, the problem is specifically that this is actually a GraphQL response, right? I, I need to get the value from the response. And there's no way of getting the value. As far as I can tell. Which is kind of silly. Um, the, okay, so the, the other way to do this is to specialize this code a bit more and just have this happen in line. Uh, so what does... Wait, this only looks at the... Yeah, this just serializes the response anyway. Okay. We can make this a lot simpler by just, we're just gonna erase this uh, this lifetime. And sorry, what does this do? So this is, if it's okay, then new response from the code. All right, so really all this needs to return, let's ignore this map function. This just needs to return, uh, a string, which is the JSON encoding. Actually, it needs to return a hyper body, which is the body we're going to include. And it needs to return whether or not it's an error, I think. That's all this code relies on. So if that's the case, then this is pretty trivial because it's just, uh, It is just going to be here, I guess this. We're not going to produce a GraphQL response at all. We're just going to do whatever value we get back. Sorry, bear with me here. Uh, So we're just going to do this blocking. And if it succeeds, uh, then we are going to do the, where's the other execute? I'm just going to do this. What body is this? And then we're going to do it, uh, is okay is v dot is okay i guess we can call this rest and this is rest and this returns now uh is okay embody 
And then we're gonna have to do the same thing down here. Um, fold. Right. So this join all is a little bit more problematic, but we can pull a similar kind of trick actually, which is we're gonna do for each one, we're gonna try ready and then we're gonna do that. Not gonna give a response. Instead, it's gonna move into here. Uh. No, no, I'm not here. This is missing something. This is missing a future pole effect. Move. This. All right. Uh, so we're going to pull for all of them. We're going to try to execute it synchronously. The problem now is what this join all is going to be is it's going to be a bunch of already JSON serialized responses. We, it just so happens that given those, we can easily produce the final JSON string. It's a little less efficient than what we would probably like. Um, but we're going to do now a map of this. So what, a jo what the join all is going to produce is it produces a, a vector of results where uh, each result is uh, an is OK in a body. And we need to produce a single, uh, a single is OK body. And you can concatenate JSON pretty easily, right? So really what we want to do here is just uh, is OK is results.iter dot uh, all is OK. Specifically, the request is OK if all of them are OK. Uh, and concatenate JSON bodies as array, which is what we want to do, right? Like if what this would have been produced, if we just, if we did the whole thing and then JSON serialized it, um, that would really just give us a serialization of a VEC of them. And a serialization of a VEC of things is just comma separated and start with a open bracket. And so we just need to modify the body to do something like body is results into iter fold body empty uh, and for each one we're gonna have uh, the I guess all and body and we're gonna have to produce what the new body is gonna be um, and the initial body is gonna be actually this right so we're gonna start out with an open square bracket and then we're gonna just add all the things with commas in between. And then finally, this is gonna to return to is okay body. Uh, so we now need docsrs hyper. Uh, so hyper body, uh, one of these, what is this? Ooh, ooh, that's even better. Yeah, let's do that. All right, so watch this. This is even better. Uh, so TX and body is gonna be hyper body uh, channel. And then we're gonna do, we're gonna send one of these. What does this, what do I have to send on the sender? Uh, oh, it's not an unbounded sender. That's awkward. How do I add to one? I can only asynchronously add to one. All right, that's fine. Sure, that's fine. So we're just gonna make the body up here. I'm not gonna be a map down here. Um, 
So we're gonna start out our body up here. Uh, sure. So we're basically gonna be streaming. We're gonna be streaming the body into this. Um, so this channel, we're gonna stream the body as the results come in. So here, what we really wanna do is, as these come back, we're gonna do something like, and then uh, a results. Ooh, is okay, it's gonna be a little bit trickier this way. Um, but the idea would be that instead of doing a join all, we're just going to do, I guess we just want to wait for all of them. We don't really care about the order. I think, I know we do, we have to produce the responses in order too. Uh, So the real way to do this is then probably dot, uh, what's the thing to turn a, we really wanna turn an iterator into a stream, I think. That's really what we're gonna do here, which we can do with the future stream. Uh, iter. Wait. Uh, deprecated for iter okay and it result. Yes, yeah, so we want iter okay. So what we're gonna do is instead of this join all business, because we don't actually need them that way in order, we're gonna do uh, futures uh, stream iter okay that turns this iterator into a stream. Uh, so that gives us an iter okay, which is gonna be a stream. And on the stream, we're gonna map each item, each request. I guess it's gonna be an end then. You. Yeah. So for each value, we're gonna do this blocking business. Uh, and then um, for each result we get back, so for each uh, result that finishes the blocking, uh, this does mean that we're not gonna execute them in parallel, which is a little sad, but it might be fine. I wish we could. Um, but I guess, the, if, if this is in fact an ordered batch, then it's not okay to issue them in parallel anyway. So this is fine. So we're just gonna iterate over the request one by one, which produces a, an asynchronous stream. For each one, we're gonna call, do a blocking call. When the blocking call finishes with the result, then we are going to, uh, we need to do something to manage this is okay value. And then we're really just gonna forward, I guess and this is gonna be inspect to do some business. Don't know how we're going to deal with this okay yet. And then we're going to dot forward into TX. Right? Does that roughly make sense? So we're going to iterate over all of the, essentially this is going to be a stream over all of the GraphQL responses. And for each one, we're going to forward them into this body. Right? So my guess is that hyper, where's the, this. The sender is a sync, I hope. It is not. Oh, that's so unhelpful. Uh, why? Ooh, wrap stream. Yeah, okay. So we can just do that instead then. So this is gonna be... Uh, Let's wait for the iter for now. So this is gonna produce 
a body. Here we're gonna map this into result dot uh, handle is okay, and this is gonna be mapped into result dot body. So for each one, this is gonna be is okay and body, and it's gonna be the body. Right. So this body now is the concatenation of all of the streams. We're also gonna to have to inject the um, uh, inject comma and the the characters to wrap around. Let's see. Do I have a good way to even do that? I think the way to do that is. Hmm. We sort of have to chain onto the stream, right? Uh, we don't have a good way of doing that. I think. Um, can I chain streams? Is that a thing that's doable? Is there an FN chain? There is. There's also a concat, but that's not what I want. Yeah, okay, so we can do this by doing uh, Stream iter okay, and then we're going to use standard iter once to produce a single element thing, and that's going to be this, right? And then we're going to chain that with this future. Ooh. So a lot of stuff. All right, so we're going to produce an iterator that first produces an open square bracket, then produces each of these, and then I guess here. What we really want is for this to alternate between producing body and comma. Uh, so we could probably use zip for that. Yeah. No, that produces a pair. That's not really what I want. Hmm. Merge. That's not what I want. Why do they make this so difficult? Hmm. I also realize that this is a fairly involved code, but hey, this is often what trying to build an asynchronous code base works like. Um, all right, so we're gonna produce the open square bracket. I feel like this should be easier. Actually, all right. There is a way to make this much easier. It's gonna be less performant, but that's probably fine. All right, let's do this the simpler way. Uh, futures, I guess future, join all. So we're gonna go back to the join all. Uh, we're gonna take, we're gonna map, this is gonna give us results. Uh, let is okay. So this is basically the code we had before. Uh, results iter all is okay. This is typically one of these. Uh, and then we're just going to concatenate the JSON bodies. And it's a little bit sad. Like it is definitely less performant than it could be. Um, but much ado about nothing. Uh, we're gonna do this by doing string concatenation. So for result in results, I guess this is gonna be in results. We're gonna do actually. We're gonna do better than that. We have to join them. So it's gonna be. Awful. Fine. Uh, bodies is results into iter map. And 
then we're going to say let body is format this 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 of body dot uh, join comma. All right, and then we're going to return is okay and body. Let's see what it says about that. Uh, two eleven. This is an either B. That is true. This is a bool, uh, 209, semicolon, 217, semicolon, there we go, that's better. Uh, try ready is a macro of futures, so we do macro use. This is now going to map over uh, is okay and body. And so this is now just going to be is okay code. Uh, this is just going to be body. There, this is no longer now generic over the F and R. Uh, we no longer need the tick A. We also don't need it here. Two and five. Uh, future is not implemented for GraphQL requests. Join all. So consider giving bodies a type. It's going to be a vec. Uh, oh, let's just have this not make a body. It should just make a string. Expected string found body. That's because this is now going to be a body from this. Yeah, so this formatting is really sad. Uh, maybe use body chunks instead. Uh, lifetime static is required. I see, yeah, so we do need this, uh, no, uh, this, just because this is tied to a tick A and this is tied to a tick A. But that should be fine. Uh, the query T also needs to live long enough. It's true. Uh, 99. Context also have to be long enough. Whew. All right. So close. Uh, this. Hmm. So this is one thing that um, could also be made more efficient. Uh, it shouldn't be necessary to clone these. Uh, actually, it might not be necessary at all. We might be that we can get away with this. 
by doing this. And then we want to move in, because we want to move in the request, but we don't want to move in the, um, the root node. So it's complaining about what exactly? So the thing we move in here, yeah, it's not gonna like that. Um, yeah, it's arch. It is arch indeed. Uh, And now this is gonna have to be this. <sighs> All right, now that compiles. Uh, these clones are set. Uh, and now GraphQL response is never used. And 19, GraphQL response is never used. Ooh, are there tests? I don't think there are tests. I don't think I saw any. Ooh. Oh. Uh, yeah, this open SSL business is really sad. I don't think there's much to do about it, sadly. Uh, yeah, my guess is the Juniper depends on something. Juniper, because depending on some like old version of OpenSSL somewhere, it's pretty sad. Through, no, why does it? Oh, they just haven't run cargo update in a while. How about now? Really? What is it that's depending on cargo tree dash D? What is depending on open SSL? Uh, invert? Fine. Uh, something is depending on an old version of open SSL. Hyper TLS. Oh, it's an old version of request. Quest zero nine. Great. Now this this might not actually compile, but <sighs> all right. In theory, in theory, that's all we need. In practice, who knows? It's funny because it's a very elaborate way to remove a relatively minor thing, but it does mean that this becomes a lot nicer. Because now this pool can go away, this can go away, this can go away, this can go away, and this can go away. The example is simpler. Uh, wait, what? Source lib. 285. No builder. What does it need a builder for? No pool. No pool, no pool. So satisfying removing stuff from code. Uh, 322. Oh, that's awful. Uh, this is because that has changed. Question, would it also be possible to use a single Tokyo blocking around the execute request function? Um, so the problem is the lifetime association between request and response. So that I think that's what makes it hard to do the blocking outside, but it might work. Um, yeah, that might, that might work too. 
It might simplify the code, although I'm not sure. You could try it. Um, header value. Oh, why do they change all of this? It makes me so sad. Um, this is in response headers get, which gives you an option T header value. And what this is trying to do is print it, which I think has to be if let, uh, okay. Two stern up. Uh, so pool spawn has different lifetime requirements. Um, well, it's more that pool spawn is not asynchronous, whereas Tokyo blocking is. That's what makes it tricky. You need to keep polling. Um, so Tokyo blocking can return not ready, whereas that's not true for future CPU pool. Future CPU pool always succeeds and just queues up the request. That is not true for Tokyo blocking. That's what makes them different. Uh, if matches. Uh, Either A, either B. I guess this needs to use futures, future either. And now there's no longer a need for the extern crate in the example. Go away, CPU pool. Go away. And where? Right. These are now all different. So this is either a, either. I really wish there was a nicer way to express these. Because this just becomes ridiculous. Uh, specifically. Uh, this one, so let's call these both B, then this is B, then this is A, then this is B. So this is one of those places where like, the box is definitely nicer. Um, and we need to use futures. Yeah, maybe we should just let this stay boxed. That's probably right. Especially given that it's an example, you really just want to show the user um, how the code works, and you don't want them. You don't want the example code to do like low-level optimizations, right? Uh, so let's just get rid of this for now. So the problem is the box new um, will normally just, so this is going to return a uh, box of type impl future. This is also going to return a box of impl future, but the two impl futures are different specific types. And so we needed to turn this into box future and needs to make the compiler realize that we actually want box of a trait, uh, which we, wait. Cannot be sent between threads safely. Plus send. Huh? Ooh, great. Whew. All right, that was a process. Um, but I think that's all. I think now we're all the way through. So let's submit a pull request. 
Hey, that's not bad on time either. Good job, team. Uh, commit. Uh, so this is where we want to be helpful. Uh, let's see. Remove uh, separate thread pool. Uh, use only a single thread pool for Juniper Hyper. I don't know if actually moving this window down makes any difference, but all right. Uh, and now let's make this a little bit more helpful. Ooh, why is thread pool underscored? Thread pool? Oh, that's weird. All right. Um, the previous implementation. So usually when I write um, commit notes like this, I like to try to explain what the previous thing did and how this is different and why the change is better. Um, it's like a good way to follow these. Um, previous implementation used a futures CPU pool. Uh, blocking Juniper operations. Uh, which caused their, uh, no. Previous implementation used a future CPU pool for executing blocking Juniper operations. Uh, this pool comes in addition to the thread pool started by Hyper through Tokyo for executing uh, Hyper's features. Um, this patch uh, uses Tokyo blocking to implement, to uh, perform the blocking Juniper operations while reusing the same uh, thread pool as Hyper. I feel like maybe thread pool is two words. Unclear. I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, which simplifies the code and also the X, the uh, API and also reduce uh, great. Let's do that. Push you origin this branch. All right, Juniper. Ooh. Ooh, that's new. Great. And then we, it's kind of nice because most people don't know about this blocking function. I'm also going to do this. Wait, where did that go? Over here somewhere. I'm also going to link to this. Great pull request. All right. Good job, team. We did it. We implemented a pull request in an open source repository, and it's been a little bit over ninety minutes, but not that bad. I think I'm. I think I'm decently happy with that. Um, all right. We did it, Devilers. <laughs> now, <laughs> oh joy. Uh, all right. We successfully contributed to open source. Woohoo! Um, now we move on to the next project. <laughs> I, I I realized there was probably a lot of uh, like there's a lot of fiddling going on there that's sort of fairly low level and it's unclear whether it's useful or helpful. Um, but like often this is the case when you're digging into a code and especially making a change that's so oriented around async stuff, like it might be hard to follow. Hopefully going back to watch the stream again might help you. Um, but let's hope it was useful. Certainly, the I think the commit makes this project better, which is good. Whew. All right, now we're moving on to project number two. 
Uh, Tokyo Beanstalk D. All right, let's see. What is Beanstalk D? Uh, a simple fast work queue. Oh, I see. So this is similar to... Right, right. This is similar to Sidekick or Factory. It seems like. So you like issue, you issue jobs. Yeah, okay, so you issue, you issue arguments for jobs to some work server, it distributes it to workers and the workers pull the, that job from the pool and then do some stuff. Uh, well, I'm glad you learned something. It, 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 uh, you are biased in that this is your crate and so you presumably know more of the low level stuff, but hopefully it's useful to other people too. Like, I also did not know anything about this, so I hopefully I've explained the process that we went through. Um, okay, so Beanstalk D, uh, big to-do list for your distributed application. Yeah, so you queue up jobs and then workers take jobs. Uh, yeah, that seems nice. Okay, so this is kind of cool. So I, um, <laughs> there's there are many of these, but um, there's another one called factory, which is pretty similar that I actually wrote the API bindings for. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what the API bindings are like here. Although my bindings are not asynchronous, whereas this one is. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, okay, so let's look at this crate. Uh huh. ASCII based. Um, Yes, a crate is like a package and cargo is like NPM. That is basically accurate. This library can serve as a client for both the application and the worker. Okay, so yeah, so this is, it provides bindings both for issuing jobs and for processing jobs. Uh, that's fun. This is basically the same library as I wrote. That's kind of fun, just for an entirely different backend and also async. Futures in crate, expand to run Tokyo runtime. Yeah, so you connect to a thing and then you can do a bunch of operations. Okay, this is funny. So this person has very clearly watched one of the previous streams, uh, specifically Tokyo Zookeeper. So compare. <laughs> this is the example that's given there of operations interspersed with inspects or assert equals. And this is the same. So I think this person has watched this stream or, or past stream, which is kind of funny. That's cool. Um, okay, so you can put a job, reserve, I think takes a job. Uh, how you started to do commits in open source. Um, so I usually, I actually got started basically because I found bugs that I wanted to fix. And so I started looking at the code and trying to figure out what the bug I observed was the problem, right? Um, trying to look for what was the source saying and what, what, what was the, essentially whether I could track down the bug in the source. Uh, and then I try to fix it. And then slowly but surely you find, if you think about it, just all of the software you use, anytime something doesn't do exactly what you want, it is probably something you could fix. And you just need to be willing to like actually go in and fix it. And then that introduces you to open source a lot, actually. Uh, what is Rust even good for? Um, uh, I don't know how to answer that question, except um, I have, Rust is the first language in a very long time that I really enjoy working with. Like I actively want to write Rust code. This is part of the reason for these streams, right? Um, why prefer it over Go? Um, you can prefer it over Go in part because it has a better type system. Um, so uh, I, you can you have things like enumerations um, that actually can contain data, which is really neat. Go does not have this. Um, you have generics, which Go does not yet have, and the proposal is kind of stupid. Um, you have much lower level control over things like memory management if you care about that, but you also don't have to care about that. Uh, you can like use RCs and clones and whatever. Um, 
I would say that if you're writing, if you don't care about performance and you want to just like write a very large code base that lots of other developers are going to be using, uh, Go is nice for like network programming. So there, that's one place you might want to use it. Um, C and C++, you want to prefer Rust because it is a much nicer language. It's a much higher level language without giving up any of the low level things you can do in C and C++. It's just a nicer language to work with. Um, like I, th I think at this point there, there are very few reasons to write C++ or maybe even C um, because the experience of writing Rust is better than writing C++. It, they both compile well with LLVM, at least most of the time, uh, and you can link between the two. So like, unless you have this huge code base that's already in C++, like, I don't see why you would, why you would. All right, so I don't know what this reserve business is. Release. It'd be nice to have comments in this to explain what it's doing. I guess we could take a look at the, oh, I guess this is the thing to work out. So put adds a job, reserve gives you a job, delete removes the job. This is a nice way to phrase that. I like this. Uh, what VM are you using? Oh, there's a, just cause I'm probably gonna get this question again. Uh, so I did a stream a little while ago where we um, uh, looked at my setup. So the, if you look for this video, uh, then that has all the details about all the setup that I have. Um, uh, we can close all of these now. Ooh, that's nice. Bye-bye. Um, if a worker cannot finish, you can release. Great. All right. So that makes a little bit more sense. So you put a job to the server, a worker reserves a job to operate on it, it deletes it when it's done, and it releases it if it can't. I don't know what touch is, I don't know what bury is. I don't know, this explained up here. No. Okay, that might be handy. But all right. Uh, okay, let's look at the docs. So I think, um, this example is pr is pretty contrived um, because usually you you wouldn't ever write this program as a user. Uh, I mean, it does say it's a contrived example, but as a user, you would never write this code, right? You're probably either a client or a worker. And so it might be good to give the examples for the two separately. Um, like basically give an example of here's a workflow for a client and here's a workload for a, a worker. Um, so split them into multiple examples, maybe under different headlines. Uh, link to what exactly? Uh, if you just go to just go to YouTube and search for my name, or just uh, I guess maybe I can post it here somehow. Like you're, oh I guess if you're on Twitch you can't see it here. Uh, I think I can do this without it being too sad. Really? It's not going to give me a chat. Oh, my internet might not like this. That URL. Um, yeah, I would probably split this into multiple examples, uh, each one for a different use case. So if we if we look at the um, the crate I have for a similar kind of use case, um, notice that it has an example for if you want to submit jobs, if you want to accept jobs. And I think that's that's a lot clearer for the user uh, instead of sort of this, this is a test really, right? <clears throat> it's not actually how anyone would write code to operate on it. Um, right. It would also be nice if these were links. So um, you now have short links. Uh, 
why do I always struggle to find this? I feel like I search for this issue like every single stream. Well, not terribly important, but um, you can, so in Rust, if you're writing some doc comment, um, if you just put square brackets around like anything, like uh, I guess, let's say, uh, what, what was the example we had over here? Delete. Yeah, so this automatically produces a, a link to the appropriate functions documentation. As you want to do this like pretty, you want to rely on this pretty heavily actually um, because it, it interconnects your documentation a lot better. Um, so that would mean that I could like click on all of these to get to the appropriate documentation, which would be pretty nice. Uh, there is an issue though where, I don't know if this uses, yeah, okay. So given that you generate the readme manually, it should be fine. Um, what Rust project are you working on uh, for this stream or in general? So for this stream, we're currently looking at this one. Um, we're going to, the hope is to go to multiple, right? Have you thought about streaming Advent of Code 2019? Uh, maybe. I, to me, Advent of Code is not that interesting. I mean, it's interesting, but it's not, uh, it's not advanced Rust in the same way. Like the, the goal of these streams is sort of to, expose people to quote unquote real world development in Rust. Um, and advent of code is not really real code. You're not building any real code base. Um, but maybe, I mean, who knows? All right, so the, the other problem with this example being so long actually is all the stuff that you really want to get to is at the bottom and really far down. So it looks like the only thing that you really want to look at here is Beanstalk D. Uh, uh-huh. Drop in the struct will close the connection. Because you connect. What's error here? It's a failure error. Okay, so this is relying on the failure crate for error handling, which is nice. Um, the only thing I could imagine here is if I try to connect, I might actually care why it failed to connect, which failure will not give me. You might want to have a, so um, I have this in Fantachini, I think. So this is a crate for interacting with web browsers uh, or for automating and manipulating web browsers. And um, most of them just have this like generic error response but new has a new session error. Um, the reason for this is because uh, I specifically want to be able to highlight reasons why connecting failed. So you can imagine that the user cares about whether it failed because of the network or it failed because of like its connection was denied. Um, the way to think about this is sort of uh, whether to use failure error or not depends on whether the caller will care about which specific error, like are they gonna match on it? And in the case of connect, they might actually match on it. Um, oh, here's a weird error or weird put. What is this? Uh, so put, Returns a self. Okay, so it consumes self. Yeah, this is this is one of those things that in the in the world of async we haven't really figured out yet. Like, what kind of receiver should you take for methods? Like, should you take self or ref self or mute self? Um, in this case, it looks like he's opting for self. I don't know if it's he. I don't know they. Um, are opting to use self, to consume self, uh, which means you can only issue one command at a time and you need to chain them, which is which means that this will be a little annoying actually to use with um, uh, async await because with async await, it would mean that you're, uh, 
<clears throat> so let's say that I have some beans. Bean, whatever. It's not important. Um, so the current code is going to look something like you do a put a foo and then and then what you get back is a is the bean because the call to put consumed bean and also the response. There will be some other stuff too, but that's not important. And then you will do something like bean dot oz, what other things are there? Reserve, right? And then you'll do an and then, and that will give you another bean and a res. And you end up writing code like this, right? And that's all fine. Um, it's like a little annoying to have to change them, but that's just how futures work. Now with async await, um, what we'll get is actually the ability to do something like uh, let res is await bean dot put foo, which is much much nicer, right? Uh, the problem is this won't actually work in the setup. Uh, if you consume self, this is going to have to be this, right? Um, which works just fine. It's just it would be nicer if the code was just this, which it can be with a wait, but only if um, these methods take mute self. If they take self, then they always return self. So you have to do this game where you keep returning it. Um, the problem, of course, is that if you take mute self and you're not using a wait, then this gets really awkward because the real way you do this is like this. And then you do, it basically becomes no better because you then do uh, this uh, map move, it's awful, uh, bean res. And then, and then your next line is going to be this. So, uh, notice that if you take mute self, then you can make it look like it consumed self. Um, it does mean that you have to take uh, take care that none of your uh, that you never have this pattern, right? Because if you have this pattern, then you when you call put, imagine the put had this pattern. When you call put the bean is a part of this future and you're not allowed to move it into this closure because it's still owned by the future. Um, and so this becomes really problematic. So the way I've ended up writing this is uh, if, if I have any of these, uh, so I turn any of these into uh, one that consumes self. And then, uh, all others are mute self. And that I think ends up being a, roughly the, the right compromise, but it is a little bit awkward and I don't have a good way to uh, transition between them or to choose which one is better. It's just very, they're just very different. Um, but so, so uh, I would probably recommend to have these do uh, mute self. Um, and it also simplifies the return value. Okay, so why do they return self and a result and the future has an error type? Uh, okay, so that's documenting the arguments to this. ID priority delay. Um, Okay, so I think this is trying a little bit to be generic. So first of all, I would probably take a struct for this um, instead of having like four arguments is a little annoying to deal with. Um, and the response here is weird. Like this error, I feel should just be a part of this error. Um, although this that comes down to this error needs to be introspected, right? So specifically, um, you need to know the difference between you tried to put a job and there's something wrong with the job you tried to put and you try to put a job and the server crashed. 
because in one case you can just retry the job or like issue a request to the user if the server crashed like there's no reason to retry and so this is one of those cases where having a structured return value is probably better for you um so i think that's what i would do here um so in fantacini i think i made this change but i could be wrong uh no, this just says generic errors. Where did I make this change? Uh, um, in Tokyo Zookeeper is where I made that change. So if you look, yeah, so Tokyo Zookeeper has the exact same problem, right? This is also somewhere where I should split up this example. Uh, although to be fair in Zookeeper, you might actually want to do all these things in order. I don't think that's the case in Beansogdi. I think in Beansogdi, you're one or the other, um, but that should arguably be split up. So here, um, oh, so I do do this here as well. Okay, so this is another case where I'm pretty sure they've just followed what we did in Tokyo Zookeeper. Because notice here, we're also consuming self and we're also taking lots of arguments and we're also returning a, a triple. Um, so arguably Tokyo Zookeeper should be updated to follow what I just said. This is something I've only recently uh, noticed myself. So I would not blame this person for doing this at all, given that I did the same thing. Um, but yeah, so notice here the error uh, for each given operation is actually a specific one. So if you look to create, these are all the ways in which a create can fail. Um, now, arguably this, this error type could be hoisted to this one. And then have create also include like a protocol error. Um, yeah, I guess this is the reason to keep them separate is that the inner result, it, it means that all of these error enumerations don't also have to list like protocol error. So maybe this is, uh, it's unclear actually. I don't know that one of these patterns is better than the other. It's just a little weird to see double error. Specifically, I think, uh, what I'm reacting to maybe is the fact that this one is not introspective, right? Like if the put failed with this error, I don't know how it failed. So ideally this should be like put error. Um, if, if there is, if there are in fact multiple ways in which a put can fail, which I assume there are, um, if we go to Beansock D, uh, client libraries, maybe protocol uh, is there not ah protocol doc great uh, so what does put return yeah so notice here there are actually responses you get to doing a put right and if you get job too big, like that's something you want to expose to the client and they should be able to match on. Um, and so I think, I think you'll probably want to have these be semantically relevant errors. Um, all right. Apart from that, these, these seem pretty reasonable. Actually, I have the same objection here to the response. So the response, oh, I see. So this is where buried comes in. I see. So some of these are in fact parsed because buried is parsed, but like this or this are not parsed and just returned as a generic error. That seems odd. Mm -hmm. um, but crucially, all of these so there's one there's just one giant response type here whereas in reality uh, uh, in reality the responses to a put are only these right so it's not the, the current api indicates that put can return any of these things but we know that that is not true put can only return one of these and i think ideally this is something this api would expose so maybe that should be the change we'll make is to make all the responses be only of the appropriate type 
this probably doesn't have to be a static string. Like the impl future can probably just return a tick A. Like this could be generic or tick A for any stir. Um, same here. Okay, what else is there? So there's error and response. Okay, so the setup is pretty straightforward. Um, let's see if there are any known issues here. Known issues, great. <laughs> great, better documentation. <laughs> well, I don't know what to do about that. I guess we could tag it as something we're working on. Uh, protocol commands, okay, that seems good. All right, well, I guess we're working towards that then. Um, so we'll fork. Great. Specifically, we'll need the protocol docs to find these. And we'll refine that. In fact, someone should probably do the same thing to... So to Tokyo Zookeeper, note that it does parse the result. It only gives the appropriate result for each one. Um, but someone should go through and, uh, if you want to, uh, replace all of these self-self with just mute self. Um, all right, let's see. So we now have a fork of this. So let's do a this. No, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, we want the original one to be upstream. Like so I'm going to point master to upstream. And now we're going to do check out a new, and we're going to say. Uh, precise uh, returns. Specifically, we're going to have to figure out how this library works. So what's in source? Lib and proto. What's in proto? Proto response. Yeah. So this thing is a lie. Uh, I guess let's first check that we don't do any Ah, cargo format does lots of things. Cargo format all. All right. Uh, just I like to do all the formatting in a separate commit, just so I don't have to think about it. So I can just save normally my editor because it uh, formats on save. Um, so proto response, and I guess here. So we know they're using failure, right? Yeah. So really what we want to do here is, uh, so for error, I guess these aren't errors actually. Uh, I have to go now, finish watching the uploaded video. Thanks again. No, of course, hope you enjoyed it. Um, all right, so let's look at what these operations are. So it's put reserve using uh, a bunch of them. All right, so for each one, we're basically gonna do something like uh, here. So this is going to be a put response. And a put response, which we load from the protocol, can be inserted or buried. Or this thing, which is an error. This thing, which is an error. And draining, which is an error. So these are the only things that are actually possible to get back. Uh, now for, what was the other one? So using, wait, what? So this should really be used, not using, but all right. So the only response to use is using. So a using response, let's see, source lib. So put does not return that, it returns a put response. Proto mod. Uh, put response. Uh, 
So this returns a put response. And this here, put response. All right, uh, using, oh, I guess these not in order, that's annoying. Reserve, all right, reserve uh, returns a reserve response. Uh, I think this is just gonna be star. Let's make this instead be pub create response. And then this is going to be a pub use proto response star. So we don't have to enumerate them all the time. I think pre job is also just pub create. And I think job is also probably just pub create. Uh, let's see. So a reserve response can only be deadline soon, which is not one of these, timed out, which is also an error, reserved. This is a reserve response. Uh, can only be reserved. All right, so maybe we can simplify these a lot actually. So a put response can be a bunch of different things. A reserve response can only be reserved, which gives you a job. Great, so job is actually pub. Oh, pre-job is also pub, okay. Fine. Uh, so a reserve does in fact give you a job. Uh, using gives you a tube. And a tube is a super tube. Nice. So this gives you back a tube. Right? Uh, So we don't need reserve response because the only response to reserve is a job. We don't need using response because the only response is a tube. What about delete? Delete. The only response to delete that is successful is deleted. So deleted is really just nothing. Because not found would be an error. So here, delete is really just one of these. That could be an option failure error, but I think we can just ignore that. Uh, release can return released or buried. Right, sorry. Yeah, release can return released, buried, or not found. Uh, released or buried. Okay, so this is gonna be release response and that can be either buried or released so so this is going to be release response touch what does touch do oh i guess bury but we'll get to bury so touch returns touched or not found and touched has no contents. And so therefore, this returns nothing. Uh, bury returns buried or an error. Yep. So bury returns nothing. Watch. Watch returns watching. Watch returns watching. I guess let's keep around the old one for. Any response. 
So watching is a U32. So this returns a U32. Ignore returns either watching or not ignored. And not ignored, oh, not ignored is an okay response according to this, but all right, sure. So watching, uh, where's F and watch? No, F and ignore. So that is a ignore response, ignore response. And so we have this here. Ignore response, and that is either uh, watching or not ignored. Uh, what else do we have? That's the last one. Great. Now, this is obviously not going to compile. Ooh. Uh, it's, okay. it's obviously not going to compile because we haven't actually made it use any of these new values, new types we've added. Um, but in particular, I think proto mod, this here currently gives a response somewhere. So this gives an any response, depending on the structure of this. Any response. Oh, this is using Tokyo Codec. We should probably use that for uh, Tokyo Zookeeper too. Uh, all right. Yeah, so notice now the compiler we're getting is that, look, you've promised that this was supposed to return one of these, but you really gave us an any response, what's going on, which is what we're expecting to see, right? Um, source lib source lib 310 so here i guess uh, all of these are any response that example is also going to become a lot simpler now which is nice uh, any response no so this is now put response that's put response this is now uh, this is successful reservation job, which is a job. Uh, this, the only reply is two. So notice how the, we can simplify this uh, a lot now. In fact, it doesn't even need to say this. It could say, I guess, uh, A, we could just have this be job right so this simplifies the documentation a lot as well right uh, yep yep uh, here this no longer needs to talk about deleted uh, this release response. So this is now a release response, which is different because, so it used to say that a successful thing is a release response, but that missed buried. So I guess the question is whether buried should be considered an error. It wasn't previously. Um, so that might be something worth looking into. Any uh, touch, we don't need to talk about it all. Uh, bury, we don't need to talk about the return type at all. Uh, and this is going to be this, which is just a U32 now. This. I guess is watching. Uh, 
And so there was another one, release response, I guess. So the successful one is, what did we say the successful one was for release? Released. Released. So this is going to be a variant. Variant. Dot released. All right. Now, of course, now when we try to compile this, it'll still yell at us because we haven't fixed that. Cannot find response in response. I don't think we care about display. It shouldn't implement display. Cannot find tube. Uh, that's a good question. Pub use proto tube. And this no longer needs to include that. All right, so now we just need to map all the response types. Uh, so let's see, release. So it gets the thing back. Uh, okay, so release, it is an error. Okay, so it does remap release, okay. So release response is just nothing as well. So release response here is really just this. So in this case, there's nothing. Uh, map that into, great. All right. So I guess really what has to happen here is Oh, handle response. What does handle response do? Handle response is, oh, it's really just doing the mapping. All right. So what we want to do here is um, dot map R and we want to match on R and if r is is actually it's a little more awkward than that it's going to be let's uh, this is r dot zero and then we're going to match on r dot one in the doc of release you would release oh yeah so this can go away now good catch uh how long did it take you to get comfortable with Rust? Um, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> depends a little on how what you mean by comfortable. Like I think I, there are still times when I get confused about why it's yelling at me. Mm, but at the same time, uh, At the same time, I think, um, I think it, it's pretty fast that you become relatively proficient in the language. Um, it's mostly like every now and again, you'll get really stuck and it's really annoying. Um, but I think that applies to almost any language. The difference is just in Rust, uh, you'll get stuck at compile time. In many other languages, you'll get stuck with some bug at runtime that you can't track down. Um, and so I, I don't think it actually takes that long to become comfortable with it. Like I'd say it will probably take you at least a few months of like regular programming. And then of course it depends on how comfortable you want to be. Uh, response, response. Did I do something stupid? No, I did want to delete that. Release no longer returns a response. The return is always just okay because buried is turned into an error. Uh, I'm also going to make our life a little bit easier here by having handle response also let you do a map. Um, uh, 
and I guess this is going to be uh, ooh, this is a closure I think it's going to be this so this is now going to be given a response Oh, actually, no, it's going to be even better than that. Uh, where is this? It's not going to be a map. It's going to be a mapping. And we're going to do a uh, great. So this is going to be this and it's going to be a any response oh in fact it can be even better i mean the question is how fancy we do we want to do this macro but um do i even remember how to write this uh rust macros where's the there's a thing macro book so maybe uh, i specifically want yeah, I'm gonna write a funky macro. Yay! Uh, Rust macro book. Uh, in terms of syntax and standard library, oh, that I think goes pretty quickly for almost any language. Like I think it takes you, it takes you a few months, and then you're, then you're proficient. Proceed. Uh, macro rules and I want the thing that lets me do multi matches which is like this bit yeah uh, specifically what's the rust hash map macro yeah, this is what I want to write. So I want a thing that gives me uh, a uh, pattern uh, and a actually. This might be overcomplicating things. I think I think this is probably fine. I'm just trying to make it even shorter, but I don't think it matters. Uh, Rachel, do you look like Charlie from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? I have been told that before. I have not seen the show, so I don't know to what extent it's true. But eh. um, let's see. So any response? No. So put is supposed to give us. Uh, what did we decide put was supposed to give us? Inserted or buried inserted which has oops which has an id in which case it could, that should map to a oh it can't map to an okay necessarily that's why Let's do this um so that would map to an okay put response inserted I guess I'm a little surprised that buried is not considered an error for put. It seems wrong, but fine. Uh, let's not change the semantics of the application at least. Uh, so that's going to be any response inserted. And buried apparently is not an error. Uh, any other response though is an error. So where's this business? So what does it do if it gets something else? It is this. Oh, it's not considered an error because for bury, buried is what you expect. I think put response should just not, should just return an ID. I think we should do this and have this return an ID. 
and then this now uses tube and ID. Which is the integer ID of the new job. Because now inserted gives you that and buried gives you this and anything else gives you uh, oh there is a put error then why aren't these exposed that's so weird I don't actually know why they've chosen not to do that also if you can get can you actually get buried to a put? I don't think you can. But you can. And buried still gives you an ID. That seems wrong. Oh, I see, because technically this is not a consumer error. I feel like th this is just wrong. Like it might actually be buried, but specifically I think put. I think this is specifically uh, add to bury. Because now this can be error put buried. Yeah, see, I don't think these should be wrapped in um, in failure error. I think this should actually give you a, a put error. And yeah, let's just do that. Right, so now we can semantically return what the actual error was without sort of trying to obscure it somehow. Uh, oh, I guess that doesn't, no, that should work, yeah. So if you got buried, that's one thing, and now we can actually, like, actually interact with all of these, right? So if we got, uh, oh, but the others are protocol errors, right? What are the other responses? Yeah, the others are actually fine, 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 fine. We can tidy that up later. So if we did not get inserted and we did not get buried, then this is some other error that we don't know what is. And in that case, I think what we want is uh, uh, got unexpected response, uh, put response this. Let's see if it ex ooh. Yeah, okay, so now it's expecting the same from all the others, um, which is fine. So for all these others, um, see, this is why I wanted the macro to do this, because then the, the last clause could be handled the same by all, but it's fine. So I guess here we're expecting a uh, reserved. Job and that gives a job, and anything else is an unexpected reserve response. And I guess all of these are going to complain, so we might as well do all of them while we're at this. Uh, So, are you doing programming as a hobby or doing it professionally? Uh, both. So I'm a PhD student uh, in computer science, and so, like, I do Rust programming for my main research project as well, which is why I get away with this. Uh, so using that's a using response. 
which is a tube. Tube is funny. It's a funny word. I like tube. Using. Uh, what else could you get from tube? Just using, right? Yeah. Uh, delete is similar, except what we're expecting to get is deleted, right? Yeah. And otherwise, we got unexpected deleted response, or I guess delete response. And this is really use, even though the function is using. Um, oh, and I guess this is a tuple. Release already does the right thing, so that's great. Touch does not do the right thing yet, because this should say touched. Uh, bury should say buried. I guess here we want this to say touch response. We want this to say bury response. So bury should give you buried. Watch. Uh, watch should give you uh, watching. And ignore should give you either watching, in which case it's an ignore, ignore response, n, or if it got, or it got not ignored. So, no. Let's see what it thinks now. Uh, variant not found. Did I misspell that? Probably. I'm always wondering if I'm the only person who uses his right hand's fingers for navigating in Vim. His right hand's fingers. Who would use any other fingers? I'm confused. I mean, I've tr disabled my arrow keys in Vim. I don't know if that counts. Uh, error is not implemented for string. Oh, what's the... Uh, this is supposed to be format error, I think. Error from... Failure, error from format should be format error. I navigate Vim using my left foot's toes. Actually, have you seen the Vim pedals? Um, so someone bought um, like uh, racing game pedals and then mapped them to escape and insert mode. So they use their feet to switch between modes, which is fantastic. <clears throat> Let's see how this works. This definitely changes the API, but I, I think it changes it for the better. Ooh. Oh, right. Now it's going to complain about these. All right. So that's sort of what we wanted to happen. Specifically using, you no longer need that. In fact, you no longer need this or that. See, this is going to make this, this is why we made this change, right? Like this goes away. This goes away. This goes away here also. So usually for this kind of code, if you're just asserting that something is true, you might as well use unwrap. That's what it's for, right? Um, so I think this should just say 
uh, assert equal response dot unwrap dot data. Right, there's no need for this extra song and dance. Uh, this similarly should just be bean dot touch response dot unwrap dot id. Although we'll have to be a little bit careful here because this is an ass ref. Uh, this is just going to be response.unwrap just to check that it's indeed okay. Uh, and then we do this, then we do this, then we do response.unwrap.id. So that makes that much simpler. Uh, do I need to have Beanstalk D installed or something? Probably. Yeah, I don't really want to do that. Um, here, we're really just checking that it was released. So this is just going to be response.unwrap. I guess as ref.unwrap. See how much nicer that code ends up now? The reason you want to use um, unwrap instead of is okay is because it will actually print the error if it went wrong. Uh, and I guess we want there to be no return value. Uh, like so. Um, Why is this not letting me do that? Apparently it wants it there, but it doesn't care here. Which is a little weird. Oh well. Uh, here it's doing the same thing. So this is just going to be job, or this is going to be response.unwrap.id. This is another one that's just responds as ref unwrap. What did I mess up here? Expected that, found that. Oh, that's why. This is lacking that. Um, this should be another response as ref unwrap. This is going to be, ooh. Yeah, put we already know just does response dot unwrap. This is response dot unwrap. Uh, so much code. Like so. Don't need any of these. I guess the question here is, okay, so we can leave this code comment in place because you might want to do that. And then this is going to be assert equals response dot unwrap is two. And then this is going to be response dot unwrap. Wait. How did this test ever pass? That's not what you're supposed to get 
return that, right? I'll just ignore return. And ignore response. Oh no, that is what you get. Okay, fine. So that's an ignore response watching. Um, do you have a GitHub or GitLab account? Yes, they're both under the username John Who, uh, like this. Four seventy-seven. Uh, this. I cannot move out of borrowed contexts. That is also accurate. Oops. to spawn server yeah so I probably need Beanstalk to actually run the tests which is a little sad it's fine it makes me a little sad to have to do this but Compile all the things. Nice. All right. How about now? Hey, it passed. Oh, it failed. What? Use of undeclared type or module any response on 46. Oh, the doc test. That's awkward. That used to be the same, is the real question here. I think that's the same. I think we can just do this. And then do this. Are these similarly indented? No. Two less. Right. Just to minimize the diff a little. Let's uh, see how that works. Hey, great. And I guess the readme as well. Readme as well. Uh, so that's going to be also the same code. Because we're not aiming to do all of that stuff too. So this minus three. Look at the diff. So that's simplified. That's simplified. Great. I pass all the tests, so I guess we submit it. Um, make all meth uh, return only. Uh, uh, return only possible. Check that that's pub crate. Yeah. 
Oh, I guess we should probably document this, huh? Uh, fine, let's... So where's ignore here? Uh, Return only possible, or I guess refine return types for all methods. That's really what we want to do. Um, previously, all methods returned a generic response. However, only certain return type, return variants are possible responses to each command. This patch, uh, this forces users to manually match on the returned types, even when that shouldn't be necessary. This patch does the matching inside the library so that only the uh, expected return value is exposed. We simplify uh, other return. Uh, if an incorrect variant according to the protocol is returned, error is returned instead. Uh, this simplifies the API and let's just not say that. All right, precise returns. Uh, <laughs> the first three hours. Yeah, uh, time zones are hard. I don't know how to, how to get better at this. Um, like I tried, there's a page called every time zone that I use occasionally, which shows you like uh, when the time is in various local times. I should start linking to that again. Uh, ooh, I guess really what I wanted is this. So let's use that instead. All right, we submitted another pull request. Good job, team. Oh, um, yeah, we started at noon Eastern Standard Time, which is about three hours ago. Uh, and we've been so, so good at keeping on schedule. So it's now three hours in and we've covered two crates. So that's an hour and a half per crate. Um, actually, let's... Um, Check up on a little birdie told me that uh, GraphQL pull requests close. Hey, look at that! <laughs> Our pull request was merged. We did open source software. This is why we need these requests. We. Hey, how about that? We made the world better, at least in theory. Although, a little unclear why it failed the test. That's, oh, just on outfair. I don't believe in outfair. Uh, great. We did that. We did that. We did that. We did all of these. Nice. Uh, Rust pointer protection is all right, but why Rust is hard to code? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by pointer protection. I guess you mean ownership. So Rust is hard to code because it's really hard to uh, write your code in such a way that you guarantee that there are no data races. And the compiler enforces that in Rust and that forces you to reason a lot more through your code. 
Uh, it's empty in here. Uh, what do you mean? Don't know what you mean by empty in here. All right. Um, great. Third crate, third and final crate for the day. Argonautica RS. So this is an implementation of the Argon2 hashing algorithm. My bio. Uh, I don't know. Is there a Twitch bio? Should I fill out a Twitch bio? Is that important? I mean, I guess I can do that. Um, so the Argon2 hashing algorithm. So this one I actually know a little bit about. So a while ago, there was a competition to come up with a new password hashing scheme. Like there are a bunch of people that just use like do like a SHA-256 or MD5 hash or something of passwords, which is generally a bad idea. You want to sort them correctly. You want to make the hash expensive to compute so that if someone downloads your database, and get all the hashes, they can't easily compute the, the corresponding passwords. And Argon2 was the winner of the password hashing competition in 2015. Um, and then this is apparently the Rust implementation of, or one Rust implementation of Argon2. Do uh, you ever work with Rocket? Uh, I have done very little with Rocket. Um, so I guess the question is, what do we want to do with this crate? So it's designed to be easy to use, robust, and follow the Rust API guidelines. Ooh, I love these. Great. Uh, feature complete. Ooh. That's a good readme. Yup. Hasher. Uh huh. Yeah, so there are a couple of others. Oh, it uses SIMD. That's neat. Um, I'm going to ID. The default configuration for Hasher Verifier, which is going to be reasonably secure. Okay. That's a lot of text. Yeah, this is basically the Tokyo blocking stuff we talked about earlier. Although my guess is this uses, um, see, that's a good question. What's the CPU pool it uses? It uses future CPU pool. But my guess is this crate doesn't actually do any, um, uh, huh, why are these, why are these not dev dependencies? I think these should be dev dependencies. But yeah, so my guess is they use future CPU pool just for the CPU pool and not for uh, any Tokyo stuff. Like I, I didn't see a Tokyo listed here. Um, oh, scope card is nice too. Yeah, so there's no there's no async stuff going on here. They're, I think they're quite literally just using CPU pool for compute um, and not for anything else. So I don't think this is one of those cases where we want to eliminate the additional pool. Um, yeah, they basically want to expose a... Interesting. They want to expose an asynchronous implementation. There's a question of whether they should rely on Tokyo for that. So instead of spinning up their own thread pool, they could have a thing that... Um, relies on Tokyo for that in, instead. Um, that way the user doesn't have to configure this explicitly here. Like you can imagine that um, that if you did this, it would just spin up, it, it would just use Tokyo spawn to run the hashing on, Tokyo spawn with a blocking to run the hashing on a separate, um, on whatever thread is available in the pool and then return a, a receiver to that. So that might be one way to get a, get rid of the CPU pool here for the non-blocking methods. It does mean that they're now relying on Tokyo. Um, so you might, it could be that we want to add it behind a feature flag, but. Mm. Any chance you can give impressions of Tokyo Bean Sock D? So we've already covered uh, Tokyo Bean Sock D or actually. Um, so I'm going to post the video and the, so you actually just missed it. Uh, specifically, uh, we did it from, 
So when the video eventually gets posted, if you go to like about an hour 30 into it, that's when we start being Sakti and we talk about it for an hour and a half. So you actually just missed it. Um, sorry about that, but the recording is there though. Uh, the day the CPU pool died. Yeah, you're not wrong. It's more that like uh, thread pools and CPU pools are really hard to get right. And we, it's good if we don't have many of them, right? Uh, and especially because the intention here is to interact well with future heavy code. Like you can do it on a CPU pool. It just means that you're now likely to have more than one pool. Um, it would be nice if this could share the pool somehow. Of course, relying on Tokyo means that if you have some other executor, then you are now relying on Tokyo instead, which is unfortunate. Um, plane. Oh, interesting. And yet they still do this business, even though they might already spin up multiple threads here. That seems unfortunate. I like this form of documentation though. I, I do worry that this is maybe slightly too verbose. Like I would have a less verbose description here with a link to the um, to the actual docs. This is a really nice readme. Like I'm a big fan, major props. Uh, BC Myers have written stuff before, but that's really cool. Um, let's look at the docs and see what we can find. Yeah, okay, so the docs are pretty much the same, which, yeah, okay, so they're using cargo readme, that's why. Cargo readme is fantastic, because it means that you can generate the readme from the source lib. I wish Rustock didn't set this ugly ass font. Specifically, why are they doing that? Just don't do that. And let me use my own font. Stop setting my font. See, see how much nicer that is? Rustock, stop setting the font. Maybe that's the thing we should do. Uh, Rust. I guess Rust lying. Rustock. Fine. Uh, Rustock. Source. Source. No. Uh, tools. Rustock. Main. That's unhelpful. Lib Rustock, maybe? I feel like this is something I. Uh, I want to submit a PR that just removes the font overrides because you should, you should never be doing font overrides. Lib Rust doc in dot dot slash Lib Rust. There is no Lib Rust doc. Rust doc themes. That's so unhelpful. Rust doc. That's still pretty unhelpful. So where did this light.css? I know this is slightly tangential, but lib rustock. theme all right well where is the external files.rs where's the css really uh, cheat sheet css In HTML static. Aha! Great. Where is it that it's overwriting my font? Where is it overwriting my font? <laughs> eh. 
I go back to this. Oh, look at that terrible, terrible. All right. Uh, where do these font stuff come from? Style.css. Oh, this is probably set by DocsRS, actually. DocsRS needs to stop that immediately. All right. Well, I'll do this later. Seems not worth it. Uh, but... templates no yes style i will fix this later stop doing that all right um so back to argonautica <laughs> rust docs aren't run by the rust team last time i checked so it's not about the no docs.rs is not it's true it, the, the handover is probably place i was thinking the style was set by rust doc when it generated the file it's actually set by docs.rs and so that's why I'm going to submit a PR to get rid of these because it shouldn't be setting my font. Um, let's see. Okay, so we have these docs. And the question is, what's down here? So there's a <laughs> nice. See, I like this. That was very good. Um, it'd be nice to have an example here. It's probably not terribly important. Just these things from your machine. This, though. The default hasher does not have a CPU pool. It's only needed for hash non-blocking and hash raw non-blocking. Oh, I see. So that's why they've set it up this way. So if you try to call it and you haven't set up a CPU pool, then everything will be fine. Um, whereas with Tokyo, that wouldn't be the case. Hmm. Like specifically, if we tried to spawn the hasher, if we tried to spawn the hasher, then um, then there might not be a Tokyo runtime running, and if there isn't a runtime running, they would just fail. So we're adding this like implicit dependency on Tokyo. Hmm. Hash non-blocking. All right, let's look at what this does. Hash raw non-blocking. This one. Yeah. Huh, that's interesting. So it actually... Um, oh, it moves the hasher. What does scope guard guard do again? Scope guard. Uh, scope guard colon colon guard. Owning V with deferred closure. Right, but it's not owning V, it's just mute self. Yeah, so I think if I remember correctly, Tokyo Spawn requires the future to be, um... oh no, it does hash or two owned. Okay, I see. And scope guard has a two owned. I guess the D refs. That's pretty weird. Why does this use a scope guard guard? Because this two owned is going to go through the hasher. It is going to go through the scope guard and just call two owned immediately. So this is really just going to clear immediately before spawning, I guess. Um, so this is just equivalent to calling clear on the original hasher after you call to owned. Unless I'm missing something. I think that's right. Yeah, I think this should be fine. Let's try to get rid of the CPU pool. 
<laughs> so uh, we have we have been making this the mission for the day, so we might as well continue, right? <clears throat> so we'll do the same thing as we've done before. We will clone this. And then we will go to here. And we'll do git remote and upstream this this make master track upstream and then we're gonna do no more uh, Tokyo over CPU pool and now well, I guess we specifically want to edit Argonauti uh, RS just uh, see that that actually compiles I assume that it does I wonder if that's the only place they use the scope card. It's used in hash raw too. I feel like that guard is just not necessary. Hello. Failed to run. Why? Source path is not an existing regular file. What? Uh, what? I mean, I guess build RS line 43. So get sub module. That's why. Great. All right, so it does test all the things. That's good. All right, so I think really what this is gonna do is it's gonna do a, it's gonna create so usually the, the trick here is to create a one-shot channel. If you're gonna have something run on the pool and then eventually tell you when it finishes, what we're really gonna do is we're gonna set up a one-shot um, one shot channel, give the sender to the future that we spawn, uh, and then just send on it whenever the hashing finishes. Are there any other places where this CPU pool shows up? I guess would be not, but configure and then hash raw okay uh i am using vim well neo vim technically but stop doing that don't care about that um so oh no yeah it's annoying fine wow Uh, let's see. So the question now is, where do we want to change this? So it's really just source or going what? Hash. All right. And cargo Tommel is going to no longer have future CPU pool. It is instead going to have Tokyo 0 0.1. We also need Tokyo, uh, thread pool zero one because we need the blocking function. Uh, source lib. So down here, we're also gonna need uh, extern create Tokyo and Tokyo thread pool. Up here, we're gonna use CPU pool is going to eventually go away. Uh, that's going to go away. This 
Okay, so I don't think the scope guard here is necessary. Although it's fine. Like, it, I don't need to change it. Um, but instead of doing this, it's going to do Tokyo spawn. Move. Well, I guess, so Tokyo spawn takes a future. And in this case, the future is going to be a... Uh, so this is the same trick as we played in Beanstalk D, right? Um, it's going to... Sorry, in... Uh, well, in Beanstalk as well. It's... Um, in fact, we played all through the day. Is using this, like, blocking stuff, right? So we're going to need futures. Do we have futures here? Uh, Tokyo Prelude Star... And then we're gonna do this is gonna be future whole of n uh, move. Uh, this is gonna be uh, Tokyo thread pool blocking move and not move, and that's gonna be uh, hasher dot hash raw. Uh, we're going to make a TX and an RX, which is going to be a few. Uh, I guess we're, we are going to need futures. And we have futures sync one shot channel. Uh, and then really what's going to happen here is we're going to dot map. Uh, this is the, the final hash. And that we're going to send on the transmit end of the channel. And then we're going to return to the user. This is the RX part of the channel. And that should be all. Right? So <clears throat> the setup is, what is error here? Error. Well, that's a good question. Uh, Tokyo thread pool. How can I? Oh, I guess. Okay, so that is a result. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's right. TX dot send. And this is going to be a then. Um, specifically, we need to match out the R. So this can be futures. Let's look at what the one shot channel is. So it's under sync. Oh, I don't want future zero two. Um, sync, one shot, uh, receiver. So the error would be canceled, which is if the sender is dropped, which shouldn't happen, but it could happen. So this is gonna be a result result. Uh, and this is going to be an error, uh, I guess, what is a cancel? Where is a cancel lived? Uh, futures, futures, uh, sync, one shot, cancel. So the question is, what is that going to be? I don't know yet. Um, uh, we do have to use Tokyo thread pool. Wait, what did I go into the? Oh no, that's annoying. Argonautica, Argonautica, RS. Right. So the other question here is, I guess if the, what's the blocking error? That's if the thread pool, if Tokyo is shutting down. And so if Tokyo is shutting down, we're just gonna drop the sender and then handle that as canceled. So all of those are just gonna fall into the same sort of category. Um, so I he think here we just do uh, map error. And we just ignore that error. Uh, ignore error because uh, it will it, it 
is handled by the cancelled case below. Uh, there is no longer a default CPU play pool. We don't need that. Uh, there is, we do need to use Tokyo for Tokyo spawn. Uh, config defaults, it's no longer a CPU pool. So this goes away. Oh, why is this? What is that? Default CPU pool certy. It's not actually used by anything, so I don't know why that's even there. Uh, verifier. So that goes away, this goes away. I guess, oh, verifier also has a CPU pool. I mean, it'll work basically the same way, right? So we're gonna go back to our hasher, uh, down wherever that was. Ah, I was right there, I saw it. So for the verifier, it's basically gonna be the same thing. Uh, we're gonna spin up a thing, we're gonna move the hasher, we're gonna move the verifier. I'm gonna do verifier dot verify. Um, I'm gonna send. That's just gonna be an OK, and that's just gonna be returned there. I'm gonna remove that. And of course, now we need all the. All these uses don't need this and don't need that. Uh, hasher config no longer has a CPU pool. So, oh, that's why it was there. Okay, that's fine. Uh, CPU pool is going to go away. CPU pool is going to go away. CPU pool is going to go away. There's also a verifier config. That goes away. That goes away. Oh, isn't it beautiful when so many things disappear? That goes away. That goes away. That goes away. Um, so where's verifier? 242. No longer needs the CPU pool. Hasher. I guess 244. No, it's the same one. What else do we do wrong? Uh, verifier 172. Oh, right. This needs to still have this line. All right, 282. Oh, the send can fail. Really? Okay, fine. This then. Hmm. I guess the problem here is really. Uh, This, we, I think we know that this can't fail because the sender hasn't been dropped. So we could do dot expect. Uh, 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 There's gonna be uh, uh, there's no way for that to be dropped really. Oh, actually, no, there is. So uh, if the user just drops the future we give back, then the send would fail, which is fine. Uh, it's okay if the user 
decides they don't care about the result. And same down here where uh, Right, that's all fine. So now, of course, the problem is now you need to run this under Tokyo to work. I don't care about that. Um, we also still need to figure out what to do if it was canceled. So it'll be canceled if um, if the thread pool shuts down. Uh, which it shouldn't be. I guess the question is what errors do we even have to express something like that? So what did the old code do with the CPU pool? So the old code just did spawn FN and that just worked. So let's look at future CPU pool. Uh, so what does CPU pool spawn FN? It gives you a CPU future and a CPU future implements. Really? How is that possible? So what this is saying is that um, there's no way for this to fail except the except in the ways that the return future from this closure fails, which seems bizarre. Like, I don't know that I believe it. Uh, Actually, here's probably the way to do this, actually. Instead of, we don't really need to do a Tokyo spawn here. We could just do a polyphen blocking. Yeah, I don't think we need the spawn. Which is nicer, actually. This can just be that. Right? Because uh, we don't. This, right. Because we don't particularly care. So Tokyo Spawn is just going to put the XU and the verifier on a different thread. We don't necessarily care about that. All we care about is the fact that we're not blocking the current pool thread. Hmm, I think this is better. It does still rely on there being a Tokyo thread pool running, but that should be fine. Uh, and so I guess really here, the only then thing we need to do here is the thread pool is exiting. So then what do we do? And now it's complaining about what exactly? I guess we should just do then R and then match on R. And if it's any kind of regular thing, it's just gonna be R. And if it's error, it's gonna be a Tokyo thread pool uh, blocking error. And then the question is, what do we do? So I think that should satisfy it. Yeah, okay. And then down here, uh, why is this jumping around in this file? It's very frustrating. Um, 
Yeah, so this is also going to be simplified because it's now just going to be here, hasher dot hash raw, and then it's going to do the same thing. Yeah, so the question is, what do we want to do if the thread pool is exiting? And this is a case that like the old implementation just ignored. Uh, I feel like it just panics. That would be my guess. Dropped. Mm. I, I mean, it could be that the right thing to do is just to panic, but where does the error come from? The error is an error kind in a display. Now the question is just like, do we want to panic here? Basically trying to figure out whether there are other places they unwrap or panic. Well, that's all in testing. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. So I guess what we do here is we return an error where the error kind is something like, what is error kind here? Uh, add context. I think we do is uh, error new dot add context. Thread pool shut down while hashing. And then this, I guess the question is what what are the error kinds? Use error kind. What's an error kind? Oh I see. I think probably what we're going to do here is then add something like, uh, we'll just add a new one, I guess, that is pool uh, terminated. Uh, the thread pool used to I feel like thread pool needs to be two words. The thread pool used to asynchronously execute operations exited uh, prematurely and without full stop apparently. Because now this can just be an error kind pool terminate. And same in verifier. The verify. Let's take a look at that. Oh, it's argon two. Yes, it is indeed argon two. Unused import. That is true. We no longer need the import of Tokyo or Tokyo prelude, maybe even. Or futures. And also in hasher, we don't need any of those. Ah, do need that. Okay. Now, I guess we still need to, okay, so this goes away. This goes away. Uh, and then here we need to say uh, the, the hashing is performed uh, is perf 
performed on the current thread. Uh, that seems performed to the current tre thread. Uh, actually, let's start with putting it here. Uh, dangling references aren't welcome. Um, that she's performed on the current thread, but I guess that is also a good question. So we have changed the semantics of non-blocking here a little bit um, because if you just wait on, I guess you shouldn't wait on this future. The semantics of this now is the current thread is gonna be used to do the hashing. Uh, but the current thread is wherever you spawn the future on whatever thread runs this future. I guess another question here is what happens if you call blocking and you are not currently running under Tokyo? Uh, probably panics would be my guess. I should find out probably. Um, I guess we'll have to look at the source. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this panics. Because I think worker with current is going to panic. All right. So I guess the hashing is performed on whatever thread uh executes the returned future um but will not but, but uh i guess we should link to this uh but tokyo blocking i guess but with a tokyo blocking annotation to ensure that the thread pool that the time is not blocked uh, from polling other futures. that I guess we do have to say that it now depends on Tokyo. Leave at least two blank lines between functions. So I would also normally leave two blank lines between functions or at least one, uh, but this is the way this project is set up and so I'm not gonna change it. You wanna conform to what um, what the original authors are doing, right? It's not your, it's not your job to set the code style policy for for someone else's code base. <clears throat> uh, is not blocked from pulling other futures. Um, note that is meth that the returned future relies on being executed by Tokyo uh, and will not Uh, and we'll panic if that is not the case. And same for verifier. 
the verification is performed whatever threads is the future. All right, and then I guess Maggie's CPU pool. Okay, so we're gonna have to run that. Uh, example arc arc tactics. I wonder why this is. Oh, this has to return a future, huh? So the question is whether Actix, I think Actix Weg does use Tokyo. What? Oh, come on. Uh, six. Really? All on top of Tokyo. Okay, so this should all just work fine. Uh, just without the CPU pool, without the CPU pool. Without the CPU pool. Don't need the CPU pool anymore. Uh, Need the CPU pool. Great. Uh, source lib still has some CPU pool stuff it in it. That goes away. That goes away. This entirely goes away, which is fantastic. Uh, RG, I guess CPU pool. Example Surdy has a CPU pool stuff there we can get rid of. Uh, all right, so it's only the README. Uh, README diff README ND. Did not change any of those. Only thing I changed was, did not change that. Did change this, did change this, did change this. Did not change this. Just to see that we haven't included any weird changes here. I don't think so. I think this is a pretty straightforward change, really. Uh, remove futures, uh, futures CPU pool in favor of Tokyo. Previously, a dedicated CPU pool was spun up to run uh, hashing and verification in a non-blocking fashion. Um, this is unfortunate uh, given that uh, there is usually already a CPU a thread pool running the Tokyo Deadpool. Ideally, uh, this patch changes the code to run non-blocking uh, 
hashing and verification on the Tokyo thread pool instead to avoid creating, configuring and creating a separate one. Um, it uses Tokyo thread pool blocking to ensure that it does not hold up other futures while doing so. Um, so one thing that's good to do is um, if you're submitting something that like changes something relatively deep, like changes the essentially changes the API without expressing that in, in the API. So we've removed some functions, right? But it's not really expressed in the API here. Um, uh, then we want to explicitly point out the fact that this does break the API. This like makes a major change to the API that would probably require a major version bump. Uh, note that this removes the ability to uh, the number of threads used to perform non-blocking compute uh, and instead uh, uh, places that responsibility on whomever sets up the Tokyo runtime. This is probably better, but does change the API. Furthermore, uh, the non-blocking methods now only work under Tokyo and will not work, uh, I guess here we could point out Actix uses Tokyo uh, and will not work uh, in other async in non-Tokyo asynchronous asynchronous deployments although those should be there alright origin Tokyo over CPU pool Argonautica, we have a pull request for you. Are there any issues here? Nope. Nope. Compare pull requests. And nope, I want. See, why is it not being helpful here and using the latter commit? Or the bigger commit, rather? And I guess we'll do the we'll be nice and do the same thing we did um, uh, that we did in the other pull request, which is add some links to the relevant thing. So this should link to Tokyo blocking. Uh, this should link probably to Tokyo thread pool. Uh, on the Tokyo thread pool instead on Tokyo's. Um, I guess we probably want to link to Tokyo, the Tokyo runtime specifically. Runtime. All right, like so. Create pull request. We did it. We have now contributed to Argonautica as well. Um, this is a slightly weirder change. I guess one thing I will point them to is I sort of actually want to get rid of the Rust format. Can I do that? Base dash I head to. I'm gonna swap these two around. I'm 
going to do... So basically what I'm doing is getting rid of my Rust format commit now after the fact. Uh, CPU pool. Uh, and I guess verifier config. In both of them, like this is pretty straightforward. Config hasher and verifier. And now it's going to be the same. Um, I think all of these are should all be just the Rust format changes. So we're gonna do reset hard, and then we're gonna do git push force. And now this should only have the one diff that we actually care about, and the files change should be much more reasonable. Beautiful, beautiful is what it is. All right. I guess now we check whether, <laughs> whether anything has happened. What was the previous one we did? We did uh, beanstalk, this one, pull request. Oh, hasn't been merged yet. Oh, well, it did pass the test though, so that's nice. Uh, how'd you get the Firefox bar, tab bar at the bottom? Um, I did a live stream a few weeks ago where I went through my entire like desktop and editor setup. So you can just look up the video for that um, in the YouTube channel. Uh, but basically, so Firefox lets you um, write CSS for the browser Chrome. And so I wrote uh, this thing. So this CSS file, if you add that, it moves the tab bar to the bottom. It's not perfect. It's just, I like it a lot better that way. Whew. Okay, let's see. So we now have this. this and where's the last one so that was the first this is the second and now this i think that's a pretty good day's work we submitted a pull request for juniper for 100 lines plus 100 by minus one for beanstalk with two 300 lines minus 200 lines plus and for Argonautica, 200 lines minus 50 lines plus. It's pretty good. I think we did well. I hope uh, I hope you feel that was useful. I, I think we're going to stop there and not do another one. There are a couple of other that would be fun to do. Um, but I think like it's been about four hours now. And I think it's probably a good place to stop. Um, if you feel like, the, so I'm, I'm gonna repeat the message from the beginning. If you feel like this was useful, like if you feel like this this format of going through other people's code and trying to make changes was interesting and useful, then please, please let me know because then I will probably do more of them. Uh, it's still a little bit stressful and it is, one thing that's hard is it's hard to predict how complicated the changes are gonna be and how uh, viewer friendly they're gonna be. Like I think some of them, or just like really nitty gritty details that may not be interesting to watch and may not be something you learn from watching. Um, but if you feel like the format was useful, please let me know. If you feel like there are crates you would like us to take a look at, please let me know. Um, if you feel like it wasn't useful or you'd like to see something else, then you're probably not still watching. But if you are, please let me know. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the next stream will be. I've also had some ideas to try to do uh, some more data structure work. Um, so we'll see, maybe that's something we would do, something from the standard library. Um, I should do like a big poll at some point to figure out what we're gonna do for the next stream. Um, it will probably be a little while because I have some conferences coming up, but at least I think, we, I, think this was, uh, I think this was useful. I will post a recording as usual on YouTube afterwards. Um, I'll make sure to try to link into where we, like useful checkpoints in the video of where we started a new crate, for example. So if you wanna go back and look at some of the things we did and maybe look at them at like, lower speed and look at the code at the same time. Uh, that's a useful way to do that. Um, 
I guess let's check if there are any last minute questions. Your desktop video made me really want to dig into mine. Yeah, I there are still things I want to change. So one thing I found since last time is, um, oh, this is an addem addendum at the last point of the video. If you have any last minute questions, you should ask them now so I can uh, uh, check them out. So Sixiv uh, is great. It's a really simple image viewer that just has Vim bindings. It's really handy if you live your life on the command line like I do. Um, the other is uh, Dunst. Uh, this thing. So Dunst is a nice way if you're not running like GNOME or KDE or something and you still want configurable pop-up notifications for things like receiving email and changing Spotify songs and stuff. This is really easy to set up and configure. I've been really happy with it. Um, I'm also considering switching my window manager away from Xmonad. I just need to find something to switch it to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the setup was pretty fun. Uh, for some reason, all of these links are dark blue, which is unhelpful. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, the YouTube channel, sorry. The YouTube channel is just uh, slash C slash my name or that link. I think this one is easier, but um, all right. Sounds good. Um, well, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, follow me on Twitter or Patreon or something if you want to see upcoming streams. Um, you could also, of course, subscribe to these pull requests and see whether there's any activity, whether they end up getting merged or not. Um, and I guess thanks for watching and have a good rest of Sunday for those of you who are still on Sunday, given your time zone. All right, bye everyone. It was a joy to stream for you again. <laughs>